All right, we're live. Good morning, afternoon, evening, Nubians and other fellow in class members, largest Africana mm -hmm. studies classroom in the world. Dr. In Greg the world. Hey, hey, Professor good Karen morning. Hunter. Good morning. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I, I um oh it's episode 99, by the way. Um, 99. I I watched Janet Jackson's documentary last night. Uh first uh, it was well, it was, it was the two parts, right? It's two parts. The last part, uh second parts tonight. Second, well, they broke it up parts one and two last night, parts three and four. It's so well done, even from the opening. And what it is like the Tina Turner documentary, people have to be able to tell their own stories. And you know, she's sitting what she's doing. Yeah, she she had she did this and it oh. it is excellent. And this is her story. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I'm enjoying the hell out of it because you know it is incumbent. It's like sitting in this space with you going through the last several weeks with Carter G. Woodson um in your office hours. Hmm. The the edict is that we have to reclaim and we have to tell our own stories about who we are, what our contributions are gonna be and right. will be. So that's right. Thank you for this. No, no, no. Listen, I'm I am honored, really, and it's it's a blessing. So I uh, I'm glad to hear that um, that it's well done. And you know, it's interesting. I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I haven't watched it. I was I will watch it at some point, and I just find myself thinking, particularly given the context of you know when we're, we're now on the cusp of this is. Uh, but today is Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I guess Monday will be Black History Month Eve. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, oh, in honor of my people at Dunbar, Nubia Garima Rogers and her teachers and all the students at Paul Lawrence Dunbar of D.C., I'm a proud member of the Carter G. Woodson Black Academy of Black Studies at Dunbar High School. So just shouting them out because them is my youngins over there and, and my colleagues over there, our colleagues as teachers. So they, they're gearing up for the annual uh um review really of what they've been doing all year round as they like to say uh they one of their slogans at Dunbar High School is every day at Dunbar so they've been doing it every day so they get to show off this month this coming month but one of the things that you think about we look at somebody like Janet Jackson um I was reading something the other day about um Esther Rowe hmm. and how you know, her battles with the network with Norman Lear to, to lead that led to the creation of good times. As we know, she was on Maud. She wasn't I suppose they had no spinoff. And uh, uh John Amos had another name, I think, on Maud. And then, but she was not, she refused to do a show without a family, without a husband. She said, We're not gonna do another one of those shows. And then as the uh as the JJ character just spun out of control, she and John Amos both. Yeah, yeah, this is absurd. And of course, they killed John Amos off, yeah. and, and then she leaves the show for a year. Remember, she got uh, well, uh, right. uh, in fact, the Tennessee State uh, alum Moses Gunn played her love interest, and then they uh, he was a great theater actor, of course, like she was. All of them came from theater, they weren't television people initially, so but anyway, and then she came back the, the following year. Um, but it was a tussle, and I think about that because. In that interim year with Walona, the Walona character, Janet Du Bois coming in to be the kind of mother, they felt like uh, uh, Jimmy Walker and Ralph Carter and uh, what's the sister's name? Bernadette Stannis. Stannis. You know, they were aging, to, so they bring in Janet Jackson as Penny. And I, you, wait, hold on. Why do you know all that? Like I, I sat with John Amos and he told me this story. Um yeah. how, how he got into it because that's he, the homie, y'all Jersey. No question. Yeah, that Jersey East Orange. Shout out to EO. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, he talked about the buffoonery no and problem. how we you know, and he challenged Norman Lear. And instead of like saying, Oh, you know what, you're right, uh, you're fired, <laughs> got rid of him. Well, Norman Lear is blacker than him. I mean, he's blacker than all of us. Anyway, so can we, do, can we deal with the, the reverse? Yeah. No, no, no. Well, well no, what I was going to say is, though, okay, that he, he didn't, uh, in that interim, they bring in Janet Jackson, who had all the talent in the world, of course, and, and a star is introduced to the rest of the world. The rest is history. But I'm thinking about it, and I'll just ask this question and let it sit there because it's really, we all know the answer. Why is there no uh, Esther Roll documentary? Because this is social structure. And no matter how great you talk about individual black achievement, hell, there, you know, we the parents of humanity, and you could throw or spit 
in the ocean and hit 50 billion black people who should be narrated before any entertainer just about yeah. and uh so if you're going to pick an entertainer and shrink it down you could still throw a rock and hit probably a thousand entertainers who you know but that hasn't been said and i'm, and I'm going to talk about one in a minute we talk about jane coma williams who dr williams knew as a young girl when she went to wilberforce as a student at age 16 um hallie quinn brown we'll come back to hallie q brown i'm talking about that in a minute but uh again this is not dissing anybody that gets documentaries made about them um over and over again uh <laughs> shout out to kamal bill who's catching hell i'm catching hell <laughs> go ahead kamal but at any rate um these documentaries keep getting made over and i'm thinking esther roll because see esther roll's story isn't just the story of an individual no. Esther's role story is the story of a generation of institutions of black formations. Esther Roll was a dancer in Harlem. You see Esther Roll dancing at the African Pride Days where Ola Tunji is and Malcolm X speaks. Him. I mean, so you, but you know, that don't fit in no easily curated list of songs and spectacles. And then, you know, having a white man uh, rip your, uh, rip your, uh, your shirt off on the Super Bowl and not be punished and you, you catch an L and then you triumph again. But I'm just saying all that to say that. You know, I'm thinking, well, the, an Esther Roll documentary doesn't help the social structure curate who we are to the social structure. It's a governance documentary, which means I guess it's uh, up to a uh, narrative. Yeah, and I was just thinking, um, but also Jan Janet comes into Gary, Indiana. No question. And so, you know, and I thought about you, you talk about your mom, her mom, Catherine, she, go she goes back and Same talks about the period of time. Oh, she does. Yeah. They, they, Reverend Al's, I mean, it's, it's Cruz family, her grandparents, and how no, she didn't go there. all the way back, but she oh. talks about the period of time and she she gets into the racism, you know, um, when they moved to Encino, and um, you know, it's it's Damn. you know, it's not going to be but so deep, but you know, at the end of the day, Dr. Carr, who who gets to green light these things, and who the people who are telling these stories, it, the depth of their knowledge, right now, you know, sitting here. And no indictment on anybody, but I am always in awe of how much I don't know. Me too. <laughs> and, 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 yes. But you, you, you're you're brilliant um, mm -hmm. on some other level. Yeah. But you know, but even in that, I'm excited though because it's like, okay, what else? What else? What else? What else? What else? Oh yeah. But but a lot of people never do the what else. So they no. they're comfortable in their ignorance, and you know, I'm getting back to Carter G. Woodson, which your masterful breakdown. Six chapters at a time over the last four weeks now. Um, the 1300 plus who've been joining us on Monday nights. That is, I tell you, I've never experienced anything like that. And the questions. Um, but we're gonna, I want to touch on a little bit of that because, you know, in um, the miseducation of the Negro, Carter G. Woodson says the race needs workers, not leaders. Right. And such workers will solve the problems which race leaders talk about and raise money to enable them to talk more Ooh. and more about. And, Ooh. you know, when I talk about bringing a brick to narrative and bringing a, you know, it's like there's no leadership here. Everybody's a, everybody has to bring a brick. Everyone's responsible. We need workers, not leaders. And what he was making a distinction, we have pastors and politicians and not a whole lot of people in the community. And I'm like, this is where we have to center when we ask children what they want to be when they grow up. No, what do you want to bring to the community when you grow up? What is, what's the skill and the talent that you're going to bring? To, we got to reframe even how we talk to our children about what it is that they want to do. What is it that you want to contribute to society? What is it that you want to bring to this community, yeah. to this household, to this neighborhood? Yes. That's exactly right. I mean, as you were reading that, and again, I mean, for those of you who are not yet in uh, narrative and Nubia, the platform, the social platform in narrative, the the conversation around the miseducation of the Negro, even for folks, and maybe even especially differently for folks who had read it before or several times, not to mention all the people who are reading it for the first time, including a lot of young people and not just young people like teenagers, which, of course, we're very grateful for that. But we're talking about little children, elementary school age children, others who, you know, came in and you know, shout out to all of the families, whether it be Arizona, whether it be Jersey, Chicago, people who came in and continue to come in a conversation. Um, I think one of the great. The great part of the great power of reading and discussing collectively and studying together 
are the revelations we get from drawing the things that we thought we knew into the things that we experience and know and then making new revelations and then having it really resonate that we can and must and have worked to change not only our neighborhoods, our communities, but the world. And as you were reading that, thought occurs to me that as we talked about over the last three weeks, Woodson Woodson publishing in 1933 during the depression in the United States, the the culmination of a number of newspaper articles and journal and magazine articles that he then put together, added a few other things and puts together this this remarkable document. Um, that that was published in 1933. And I think about Jamie Williams, who we talked about a little bit last week, who made transition. She and my mother made physical transition the same day. She was uh, they had uh, the first ritual of celebration yesterday, uh, watched it online in uh, Atlanta at Big Bethel on Auburn Avenue, same place that they had the first celebration for her husband, uh, McDonald Williams, who they met on the campus of Wilberforce. We'll talk about that in a minute. And it really does tie to this conversation about institution building and bringing a brick and building. Um, they were married, I think, 1943. I can imagine that. <laughs> they were both on the faculty at Wilberforce by that time. But when Woodson published the Miseducation of the Negro, was 10 years before that, Jamie Coleman Williams was 15, born 1918. And as you were reading that, I'm thinking how powerful it is because we have to bring bricks to do two things. And I'll say the uh, the second one first. To build, of course, to build where there was nothing built before, to improve the environment. And Dr. Ma Dr. Mack, McDonald Williams used to always say this. In fact, their grandson, Doug, and, and sympathy uh, to the family, to the entire uh, Williams family. So uh, their daughter, Donna, uh, who was raised in Nashville, born and raised in Nashville, Pearl High grad. She was in the street with Diane Nash and C.T. Vivian and John Lewis and all of them because uh, she was a high school student. And as, and as Dr. Jamie Williams uh, used to talk about, and in fact, she gave a long interview with our man, Larry Crow, for the History Makers, where she talks about them being on the faculty of Tennessee State. Dr. Williams had gone and got a master's at Fisk. Um, after she graduated from Wilberforce at 19, following year, she got a master's at Fisk, came back to Wilberforce, and then they moved subsequently uh, because Dr. Matt McDonald Williams, her husband, got a job at Morris Brown. So they taught at Morris Brown. Uh, she had taught at Shorter College, named for Bishop Shorter in Arkansas. She taught at Edward Waters in Jacksonville. Um, they both got their PhDs at Ohio State University. Okay. And uh, anyway, I said all that to say that. You know, she talks about how the adults in Nashville, the black adults in the black community, even as they bombed the home of Z. Alexander Luby, the lawyer who I've talked about before, and his young protege, Avon Williams, who lived in that neighborhood as well. Avon Williams, very important figures. Uh, she said the adults in Nashville were the ones who raised the bail money for the students, some of them even mortgaging their houses to make sure they raised the money. And, they, and she said, we were the backup and support, but no, but you were the community. So the second of the things I mentioned at first is while we have to bring bricks to build where there isn't there. And as Doug said yesterday at uh, who is now the general counsel for the AME church, they he, he, hardcore AME. We're going to talk about that as well, because that's the first thing of the two. But I'm saying the second thing first, Doug said that you know his, his grandfather used to always say that uh, you should touch something while you are walking the earth. Mm. And then make it better than it was when you found it so that when you go on to the next phase, those who remain here for a time in touching that thing will feel the, your resonant spirit of how you were when you were still on top of the earth. So mm. that, you know, you bring a brick so that those who will never see you with their eyes and only know you from the spirit and being an ancestor can hold the thing and say it she held this thing she built this thing so in, in very many ways narrative and nubia this is a thing that survives us when we become ancestors this will be a thing but that's the second thing and then the first thing is very easy you bring a brick in part for the same reason that young people are called on to uh periodically renew 
the walls of the Grand Mosque at Timbuktu, which has been there since the middle of the last millennium. <laughs> so so you, why? Because that thing itself, when you're looking at it, and Asia does as well, Chinese do it in particular, you know, the thing you're looking at may not be materially the exact thing that began there, but in renewing it, you are making sure it remains the same space in terms of how it looks. And so when in a minute we talk about Jamie Williams and we talk about Carter Woodson and all, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Hallie Quinn Brown, all these people, Dr. Williams, both of them, but especially her, because she's born and raised AME. Her brother was a minister, also one of the first black army surgeons. Her father was an AME church minister. When Carter G. Woodson published The Miseducation of Negro in 1933, Jamie Coleman Williams sitting at the dinner table with her father, uh, who was Frederick Douglass Coleman, named for Frederick Douglass, was sitting with a man who knew Frederick Douglass, who was the bishop of the AME church, Reverend e. Cassius Ransom. We're going to talk about Reverend e. Ransom in a minute. And Reverend e. Ransom said, where are you going to go to school? She was in Dunbar in Lexington, Kentucky. She lay from Kentucky. And she said, well, I want to go to Wilberforce. And all my friends going to Kentucky State in Frankfurt. That's the HBCU in, in, in Kentucky, if y'all don't know. And Bishop Ransom was like, well, you too young to go to Wilberforce. But she made the case. Jamie Coleman Williams got a scholarship to go to Wilberforce University. And a 15-year-old, as a 15-year-old talking with the bishop, saying, I want to go to Wilberforce because that's my heart. And this is the same year that Carl G. Wilson published The Miseducation of the Negro. Why am I even saying all that? This is not ancient history, y'all. And this, that, 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 that second one, bring your brick to build where there wasn't something, really extends from the first one, which is what? Add your brick to the institutions that already exist. Because when you forget your institutions, this is when they can make up anything they want. And when they make up anything they want, you will always be a figment of other people's imagination. But I'm going to stop there because we can continue. No, I mean, this falls in chapter 10 uh, in ah, yes. Let's of do the it. Negro. The, uh, Carter G. G. Wilson says, by forgetting the classroom for the time being mm. and relying upon an awakening of the masses through adult education, we we can do much to give the Negro a new point of view with respect to economic enterprise and group cooperation. The average Negro has not been sufficiently miseducated to become hopeless. Ooh. I don't know if that's the case yet, but this is where I want you to Ooh. bring Come in. On. Come on. He says, our minds must become sufficiently developed to use segregation to kill segregation and thus bring to pass that ancient that ancient and yet modern prophecy, the wrath of man shall praise thee. How do we how do we use segregation to kill segregation? I mean, we're in a strange space right now where folk are uh, remitigating what is black. <laughs> you got you got white nationalists talking about people are not black like Michael Eric Dice, they're tan. Um, what is this black thing anyway? Oh, like, that, was, that was cute. That was, uh, what's that crazy white nationalist that people think uh, just because as my mama would say, coming from her uh, parents and ancestors, you know, old black folk, you say, even a broke clock is right twice a day. Cause just cause Joe Rogan write about one thing, y'all don't be trailing behind this white nationalist. He He's wearing gasoline draws and light matches. Now y'all can watch him run down the street. And unlike Richard Pryor, I feel no special obligation to try to save Joe Rogan. So the whole point is that him and that old white man toe are really kind of white. I loved it. Did you? I, oh, I love it. I love it. Cause here's the thing about whiteness. Whiteness drives everybody crazy, including white people. Because here's the rev here's the revelation. Of course, there are no white people. And of course, there are no black people. Because the people who you identify with, white men, uh, invented this color-coded hierarchy to engender a feeling of superiority. But what it does, in fact, is engender a perpetual instability. And insecurity. And insecurity. Yeah. So these are two insecure men uh, braying as white maleness often does with this kind of phallocentric, you know, <laughs> I mean, well, anyway, let's not even. Yeah. I mean, shout out to Joe Rogan, the Joe yeah. Rogan experience, because that ain't what this is. So, you know, let them talk crazy. I mean, yeah, yeah. some of our people get pulled into that stuff. <laughs> so, so, how, so how do we kill, uh, as Carter G. Wilson, what was he saying? We have to. 
Oh, we had a good conversation. Hey, y'all, if y'all, yeah, look, if y'all, y'all. We must become developed to use segregation to kill segregation. Y'all missing out. Y'all missing out when you don't understand how w Woodson. Okay, let's let's think about that in context. Let's think about that in context. And we talked about this actually uh, week four last and then brought it up last week with the final six chapters again. Woodson is writing during apartheid. He's writing during Jim Crow. And the miseducation of Negro is, is one of, in fact, Woodson's most succinct, succinct one place statement on seeing the facts as they are. It reminds me of the Senegalese scholar and intellectual warrior, Sheikh Anta Job, who uh, once said in an interview, his only trip to the United States, uh, so when he went down to Morehouse and you know sat with Lister Belt Middleton, the great uh, journalist out of South Carolina, and he said, you know, there was a time in world history when African people uh, created and presided over vast territorial he, I don't know if he said empires, but you know, he's these, and, 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 and certainly there because there's critique of empire. This isn't to celebrate. In fact, I'm reading a book. There's a young brother out of uh, Atlanta, I think William C. Anderson, just got a book called The Nation of No Map. And he he's very critical of those he says who romanticize history. And he's just there's this odd fascination with Egypt. And I kind of smile because you know, clearly he doesn't know enough about it to talk about it, but. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't get a publisher these days. In fact, I think ignorance may even be a prerequisite to getting a, a contract with a lot of these publishers. But I kind of laugh because clearly you don't know enough about Egyptian history to understand the nature of why there is a need to, to, to understand that society. It wasn't about pharaohs. And if you think it's about kings and queens, you you, you clearly don't. You, as my mom would say, you open your mouth and put your brain on display, which means there's an opportunity now to learn. But I'm saying not to say this as it relates to Woodson. The Sheikh Anta Job said that there was a time when black folk had these large configurations. And here's the point that I'm about to make and tie it to Woodson. He said, um, and and if you came to them to and and and, and said to them, this is what's going to happen to people of African descent. He said they wouldn't have believed you because they never would have believed that the situation could have been could be reversed. I mean, the idea of slavery, colonialism. What they did? We did what? Wait, do you who? You mean the Val Amu? You mean you you talking about the nomads? The one out there in the desert? Wait, there's one beyond that? Wait, it's cold. Where what? they gonna what? Okay, well what, what do they have? What? Wait, they don't even have a, a an alpha. They don't, they don't write what? It, man, get out. Hey. Get this cat something to eat, or but no drink because clearly you're drunk. <laughs> you <laughs> understand now. What does that have to do with Woodson? Well, Carter Woodson and the Miseducation. We know the title of the book. We know some key quotes from the book. But in reading the book, in rereading the book, and having conversation, what begins to emerge is Woodson is writing from a very pragmatic position. And that actually is the rest of what Sheikh Anta Job said, which made me think about it. Job says, when you study your history, when you study your memory, when you're in deep conversation with yourself, when you, in the words of Jacob Hudson Carruthers, break the chain that link African ideas to European ideas and speak to your ancestors without interpreters. In other words, all right, well, this is what they're saying. Now, nah, look, we'll talk to you in a minute, but I'm having a conversation in the governance structure with my family. And then we're going to share it with the social structure because we think all humans, which is what Woodson said, we think all humans will benefit from this. But what I can't continue to do, what we're not going to do, to quote the narrative shirt of the same, what we're not going to do is you're going to tell me, Norman Lear, what my Mama would say to my father, we, 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 we no, 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 we're going to talk and then we're going to tell you what we're talking about and then you get in where you fit in. But what we're not going to do is, oh, yeah, well, she means so and so. Hell no, I'll quit this show before I, you know. But Woodson is writing from pragmatic. So what he's saying is, what as Sheikh Anta Job said, oh, wait, I'm sorry. And then the final piece of that is, Sheikh Anta Job says, when you study yourself with no hype, with no myth, with no attempt to make yourself bigger or smaller than you were, with an honest, clear-eyed attempt to understand the human experiences that we have had before we came to this moment, 
he says, this is the key line from Shake Unto Job. He says, it gives you the serenity to accept the facts as they are. Mm. It gives you the serenity to affect. And then when Woodson, and we'll look at this uh, in 1927, the year after Negro History Week started, he published an editorial in the Journal of Negro History, which he had started in 1916 where he says, we just finished our first Negro History Week, and he goes into what that means. And one of the things he says is that, and he says this over and over again over the course of the rest of his life, which would last another uh, 23 years. Carter Woodson said, when you lay out the facts as you know them and continue to research and continue to explore your history and your memory, he said, and don't myth make, just tell it straight. He said, you will see that there is no need for any undue pleading by the Negro. Mm. He said, in fact, it is not Negro History Week. What it really is, is the Negro in History Week. Oh. He said, just, just tell, you know, Woodson is so, but what I'm saying is we're living in segregation. Now you got some bourgeois Negroes who say, perhaps we can get over there and we need to find, and he says, I'm all for that. You got to get these laws changed. But you're living in segregation now. So guess what? All of those lawyers who are going to defeat Jim Crow are being trained at black schools. So they are using already segregation to defeat segregation. No, Woodson is being very clear out about this. Meanwhile, people, well, no, we can't accept that. So in other words, you're saying that, that room you're sitting in right now. Yeah, like my mama, Uchi Valley, little training manual training school out in Rosenwald schools in the South where she learned how to read and write until the day she made transition. My mama writing looked like a computer typed it. Why? Because even in the third grade, them segregated teachers in the South was like, oh, no, y'all going to learn how to read and write and spell and do all that, even if it ain't with four pine benches in here and a, and a slate board in the front. Do you understand? And even if you can't come in here for nine months out the year, you got to come for six months out the year or three months when you got a break during the summer. Okay, you got to do, okay, no problem. But when you're here, you're going to get this. So what's in the sand? Now, since we sitting in there, you're going to go in there and tell them kids, you know what? Y'all shouldn't learn to do nothing until you have an integrated school. What's hmm. something very pragmatic? What the hell are y'all talking about? But then he, but then in his critique, he's like, oh, I see. These them eight Negroes they let in around white folk. Because the rest of these Negroes ain't been close enough to white folks to learn inferiority, to believe that their schools are better than ours. And I promise you, every Negro I see who's arguing about, you know, with the desegregation, integration was our goal. Integration wasn't our goal. Resources was our goal. Resources and change these laws was our goal. If you think black people were that stupid to turn over the thing that we know grounding our culture in excellence and extending that, turn that over for a chance to go sit next to three white people so that you think they was picking the white doll before that, which they weren't all of them. Come on, Kenneth and Mamie Clark. The question is, how many white dolls you think they're going to pick when they sit next to the human the doll is modeled after? Get Come the on. hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. So, how, so, and this is what, so again, uh, this man writing in the 1930s, yes. 20s, how is he able, we, we're battling right now, books are being banned, whole curriculum around, and I know it's going to be a whole ass mess next week with Black History Month with a whole lot of states mad that we're going to be studying people. Um, how did Carter G. Woodson get a Negro History Week in, and then which turned into a Black History Month that we all accept now? How was he able to do that? And I'm just, I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, go through the blueprint of that because I'm, I'm sure there's a lesson in there for us right now. Well, I think, um, and and, I, and let me just one more thing on on the piece of, on the self segregation because Woodson, in th that decade of the 1930s, is very interesting. I just give you two quick examples. Two towering figures who didn't always get along, because Woodson didn't get along with a whole lot of people. He was a single minded guy, and this other cat, he loved black people, but sometimes it was more theoretical in practical in the sense that you know he thought he was better than people, and he was better than a whole lot of people. But I mean. The service, you can't deny. That's W.B. Du Bois. Um, and I'm only saying this in terms of a social structure narrative to reinforce the thing that probably one of few people know about either one of them. You know, uh, Du Bois was the first person of African descent to get a Ph.D. in history, Harvard University. Woodson was the second and the only one who uh, ever came out of Harvard University with a doctorate whose parents had been enslaved because Woodson, uh, Du Bois, of course, was in Massachusetts, Great Barrington, the Black Burkharts. He had to go back generations but to see that 
But I'm raising that to say that in the decade of the 1930s, both of them um, run afoul of the single-minded integrationist strain in the black kind of petty bourgeois. Woodson received criticism in, in for the miseducation, including for statements like that. But, and then Du Bois, who two years later published Black Reconstruction in America, and during that same decade, it was 1934, when he revised his Talented Tim thesis at a speech he gave in New York to uh, uh, Sigma Pi Phi, he was a member of Sigma Pi Phi, who was commonly known as the Boule, saying that, you know, we might just need a talented tenth. We ain't even got 10%. Maybe we can get a guiding hundredth. I mean, there are enough people in this room with families who, if y'all will turn back toward the people. And of course, one of the themes of Association of Negro is uh, Woodson is saying, y'all, these people who, who quote unquote make it, they'll be okay. But they don't, under, he, in fact, he had a whole chapter in there, understand the Negro. He said, y'all ain't even dealing with the Negro. He said, the Negro needs institutions. We need education. We need to develop and continue to extend our institutions, train our people uh, while we fight to change the laws. So there's no Jim Crow, which he calls, in fact, what was that in uh, where you were reading there? Chapter um, chapter 10, the loss of vision. He calls segregation a sequel of slavery. Literally, he writes that. So, I mean, people now talking about the afterlives of slavery. But that ain't new. Woodson was saying that in 33. And before that, there were others. So he's not saying we should stay in the this Jim Crow, this apartheid. He's, saying, he's not saying that. He's saying, but while we got these institutions, we should maintain them, develop them. And when you can then not exclude people from them, then you can, we have other people. Of course, it's beautiful, but you shouldn't give up your institutions. Now, I'm saying I have to say that they both paid a price. Du Bois even more so because Du Bois gets put out of the NAACP for saying the same thing. He's saying while we're fighting these laws. And remember, in the miseducation, Woodson's very critical of lawyers because during the 1930s, 1930s you see several of those cases which make it to uh, the federal courts, courts of appeals, Supreme Court. Black people lose. And Woodson is critical because he says, this is why I'm making the case to improve our institutions so that we can train the lawyers and so that the lawyers can have the type of preparation and skill development that will enable them to win. Because we already know they're going to take every argument that we make and try to twist it. So you got to at least rob them of the substantive argument so there can be nothing left but naked ideology. Which is, you know, I mean, if you're going to be a lawyer, that really would be, you know, that's the strategy during that period. But of course, during the 1930s, you see Charlie Houston and them guys at, at Howard Law School began to train Thurgood Marshalls, the Spotswood Robinsons, the Oliver Hills, the Pauli Murrays. But Woodson is writing at the beginning of the decade and really with the essays that become the Miseducation of Negro in the late 20s even. And he's anticipating what will become the place that people in retrospect will refer to as the uh the west point of the civil rights movement which i think is a kind of insult to howard law school if you really stop thinking about it what the hell is west point but the point is that you, you train those kind of people now i, I said i'd say this what's an andrew Bois catch a little hell for that du Bois gets put out there in basically because they're single minded he's a, he's a, he writes about this idea of since we're in segregation let us turn inward and develop our institutions and they accuse him of being anti-desegregation he's like what are y'all talking about this is it. so 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 but the point I wanted to make and then we you know we talk about these origins of negro history week in, in relation to what you read there in uh, chapter 10 the loss of vision Woodson in like chapters 9 10 and 11 particularly when he gets to the the question of uh, of trade and business in the black communities he says something that is so so insightful he says this he says that black people the negro is not protected from whiteness, but white people are able to penetrate the black community at will. What does he mean by that? He says, we are segregated by law. And yet, he says, the Negro will walk past Negro banks to go downtown to Washington, D.C., and put their money in a white bank where the ladies have to use the colored restroom, they will walk past the Negro restaurants and shops to go to the white shop where they have to stand up outside and eat. He says, so what that shows you is the white community has penetrated the Negro community intellectually, and the result is that we 
already are integrated in terms of them absorbing us into something that's against our interests, but the reverse is not true. They don't come to your neighborhood <laughs> and patronize your businesses. They don't come. And now, of course, fast forward to 2022, of course people come to the Black community and do what? Jack the swagger. So if you think you out there, you know, you out there working on your brand, you influencer. Even. Meanwhile, all these companies watching the algorithms, sucking up money like you out there picking cotton. Do you understand influencers is a 20, 21st century form of cotton picking? You're better compensated. You know, you throw a ball through a net or some of you Negroes going to line up and watch the damn Super Bowl in a minute. Because, you know, yeah, sure, they can put their knee on your neck and kill you. Sure, they can bust up in your house and shoot you, kill you in your bedroom in Louisville. Sure, they can, you know, run you down and hunt you down like a dog. And maybe them two white boys will go to jail. But, uh, yeah, they can stick you, roll you up in a mat and say that you did it to yourself. I mean, hey, you, you name it. Yeah, they can just pull up on you and you got a BB gun, 12 years old. They just blow you away. Yeah, sure. They can just stop you and, you know, just be your car start rolling. They empty their clip in you. Sure, they can. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on. Meanwhile. You get a few of them Negro entertainers together and you got, you know, what is football? 11 on 11. And in certain moments, it like it's 22 Negroes out there in the field. And uh, you'll watch because you don't even have the dignity and self-respect to allow yourself to say, I can't watch. And Woodson is saying in 1933, he's saying it's because they have penetrated your consciousness, mm. which means it's already integrated in terms of your 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 the way you move through the world, except you can't do that, which is why they're so upset and will be upset if Deion Sanders replicates himself three or four more times and all these kids start saying with well, HBCUs, it was all fun and games till they start leaving Florida State. It'll be all fun and games till they start leaving Auburn and Alabama. It'll be all fun and games till they start leaving the University of Texas and 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 Duke and start playing basketball for Grambling or Morgan State. At that point, it's not fun and games. Then you're going to see who you're really dealing with. But what's it is saying to the point that you raised in chapter 10, and then 11 and 12, as he's talking about these businesses, what what's it is saying is, since it is already segregated in terms of power, let us use the institutions we have to generate power from within, and then we come to the table with a table of our own. And then we can have, but see, you will always know when you are upsetting the power balance, by two things, either they're going to ignore you or when they cannot ignore you anymore, they're going to come after you with everything moving, except the first wave they send now going to look like you. <laughs> so please understand, because that's mm -hmm. what Nick Rose Woodson is talking about. Now, now, where did it come from? Woodson and there, there are, there are, you know, uh, there are several origin stories. And the thing about origin stories is you can always make up a different one. Hmm. So in 1926, by 1926, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, which had been founded in Chicago in 1915 by Woodson, uh, was over a decade old, obviously, 11 years old. And Carter Woodson was part of a tiny group, a tiny group of Black people in the United States of America who had been able to uh, acquire, quote unquote, higher education. And I say be able to, because as we know in the miseducation of Negro, he's very critical of that group. One of the reasons he can be very critical of that group, because he knows them all. I mean, it's very interesting to see how, for example, uh, I was just getting ready for my law school class. And you know, what did I do with across the color line? Anyway, rereading some of the documents around the, the Amenia Conference in New York, where you got these generational conflict. They invite all these uh, uh, Troutbeck is the name of the estate, Joel Spingarn. So, you know, white folk, you know, it, it's the equivalent of the Ford Foundation or the Mellon Foundation or the Jukabugugu Foundation, the Blank Foundation, the Finland the Blank Foundation, inviting all you Negroes who going to, you know, make revolution, paying for your airfare, paying for your lodging, making sure you have three meals and snacks, keep it put out continuously. And then they put you in a wonderful edifice and then they record everything you say while you're talking. And then three of the Negroes are picked to curate and write the report. And then they put it out on how you're going to plot revolution. Anyway, it, they had something like that called the Amenia. <laughs> the Charles Hamilton Houston, Ralph Bunch of them is there. And you got some of the communists, some of the socialists is there, you know, Du Bois and them is there, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, another figure who people may not have heard of, Emmett Dorsey, was on the faculty at Howard University for a number of years. I never met Emmett Dorsey, but I was fortunate enough to be on that faculty with a number, well, a number, enough faculty members, all of them who are now retired, who were his students at one time. 
Dorsey was one of them radicals. So they all up in there talking, you know. And I I'm saying I'll just say that there was generational differences. And I won't get too far into this because, I mean, you know, you, you, so you got the younger cats bunching them, you know, Houston and them. Like, you know, y'all moving too slow. Even Du Bois, they would say it's not radical enough. And now, now, mind you now, while all this talk is going on, there's a movement that they have neutralized, they think, which they really didn't, it's hard to kill an idea, but they have gone after a, 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 a formation that they thought might be problematic. That would be the Garvey movement. The Garvey and them not asking y'all for nothing. Now, did he make mistakes? Yeah, he met with the Klan. To this day, people saying Garvey shouldn't have met with the Klan. Carter Woodson was writing in the Negro World, the U Universal Negro Improvement Association newspaper. And then Garvey, it gets out, Garvey met with the Klan, saying, y'all believe in segregation? We believe in segregation. We're going to leave you alone. You leave us alone. We need to stop. In Garvey's mind, he negotiating with some terrorists so that they will stop fighting and, you know, this kind of thing. But in the rest of and remember now, Garvey from Jamaica. So even an African from another place not completely in tune with how that would hit the ear of Africans in this country. But then you got black elites, A. Philip Randolph and your Chandler Owen and them saying, see, Garvey must go. Now they're going to get nativist with it. And y'all going to play into the hands of these white boys in what becomes the FBI, the Military Intelligence Division, led by a young cat out of George Washington Law School named John Edgar Hoover. That's a story for another day. And they deport Garvey. But that's not the Armenian conference. Garvey would never have been invited to the Armenian conference, right? Because you are not, you building out a black institution. We need these, we're cultivating these Negroes to see what we can do in terms of mutual progress. Yeah, but mutual progress, as Harold Cruz writes in his book, Plural But Equal, means you get to come to all our meetings and we can't come to none of yours. This is what Woodson is writing about in Miseducation the Negro. So Negro History Week, Woodson is convening a ritual after a decade of developing an association that is about the recovery of black memory. He is developing a ritual whereby he can expand awareness of the Negro in history. He can further enhance the capacity of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History to do that work, which includes recovering memory. Because in the Journal of Negro History, when you read the first, uh, not just the first decade or two, but yeah, especially then, what's in many of the things they're doing, what they're doing with the Journal of Negro History, he's making an appeal. He says, if you have documents, Negroes, in your attics, in your basements, family papers. Send them to D.C. We'll copy them. We'll publish much of this in the Journal of Negro History. He's literally just trying, he's fighting a race against time because, remember, Woodson born in 1875 and that first generation to come out of, uh, after enslavement, he's, we're trying to record as much as we can from that period. So he's really using the association to capture as much memory as he can at, before this generation disappears and becomes ancestors, this kind of thing. Pause. I have a full set of the journal Negro history. And I, I told this story before, but right on the, uh, on the eve of, uh, of Black History Month. So let me just say this very quickly. My set came because when I was working for the school district of Philadelphia, it's around 1999. Um, I would always like on the weekends, at least once or twice a month, at least once a month, sometime more, if I could get away, go to New York city hunting for books, we call it book hunting, right? And I'm up there looking at, and I went in the shop on 12th street. that's no longer there. Probably about, about two blocks from the strand. And I was in the basement of that. We were looking through there and this is old cat used to run the place. And so me and him got to, you know, know each other pretty well. And he said, Hey, I got something that you might be interested in. And he, these these unopened cardboard boxes, you know, tucked. By, I opened the flap. Yo, it's a full bound volume of the Journal of Negro History. I didn't have one at the time. So how much you want for it? I was like five hundred dollars or something. Like that. Well, I ain't got five hundred dollars, and I wasn't making that kind of money. As I said, but he said, "Don't worry, put something down on it, and I'll let you buy it on time. No problem." So the following week, I went out to University City High School. Shout out to University of Pennsylvania, the great colonizers of West Philadelphia, because that school isn't there anymore. Neither is Charles Drew Middle School to sit next to it where we had a freedom school because they wiped that whole corner off because they continue to colonize West Philly. Shout out to University of Pennsylvania. But anyway, that school district building was there. The principal's name was Florence Johnson, still alive, sister from Boston. They used to call her Flojo. Brilliant educator, old school black educators. Again, what's the lesson from this? Educational institutions should be run by educators. 
by educators, not any brilliant business minds. It's, 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 all, it's all cool. You can have somebody like that on your staff, but you need teachers. You really need teachers. But anyway, she was a master teacher and, and a master administrator. So she asked me to come over there and talk to the young men about hip hop and how we could use hip hop because she said it ain't going nowhere. You know, she was old school, so all this, uh, but she said, but but they they listen to that stuff. So can you talk to them and try to make a bridge? Sure. So I met them in the library. These young brothers, probably about maybe, I don't know, it might have been 75, 50, 75. I don't remember. They're teachers. We're all in there. And so I was using hip hop lyrics and then we were talking about the lyrics and connecting it to history. I think that the song I used that day, I played it, you know, and I said, okay, do y'all know this song? Yeah. And so I said, okay, if you know this song, then everybody, I'm gonna see do y'all know this song. So I put on Slick Rick, the children, a children's story, right? And uh, uh, sure enough, they knew all the words. They knew, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's, you know, <laughs> that's that, that song to me was a great teaching tool. I use that song many times and, you know, um, I'm trying to remember how it goes. Um, there was a little boy that was misled by another little boy. This is what he said. We spent 30 minutes on that. <laughs> I mean, the whole question appeared. The little, the little boy, no, 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 no. I mean, at the beginning, you have this notion of not pristine, but at least a grounded communal, you know, uh, once upon a time, not long ago, when people got together and lived life slow, when laws were stern and justice good, and people were behaving like they ought to good. The little, little boy who was misled by another little boy. That's all you need to understand by the question of genealogy. The first thing it is, y'all talking to each other. What about the old folks in your family? Are there any rules for how y'all talk to old folks? Then they started demonstrating that they understand protocol. To, to borrow uh, from Angie Porter's theory of Africana legal studies, children know how to act. But then you start listening to each other without any intergenerational transmission. And that's when you get in trouble. And then we went through saying we've gone through all that. And so at some point I said, hold on, hold on, give me a second. Because this library here, they haven't thrown this library away. All y'all working in public schools, y'all know, they've destroyed the libraries in the schools of this country. They don't even call them libraries anymore. They call them information resource centers and shit like they claim everything is digitized. But there was a time, particularly after the Black Studies, Black Power Rebellions in the 1960s and 70s, that if you lived in a city like Detroit or Philly or New York, you go into a school where Black children are, the budgets had swelled just long enough to buy a lot of black books. I have a lot of books that are from deaccessioned libraries all over this country. That's how I was able to complete my, my uh, set of the Negro History Bulletins. Unfortunately, I got a whole contingent on matter of Indianapolis public schools. They're going to throw the books away. No, y'all not. I'm going to convene this library here. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but I'm saying that happened a lot of places. Well, it happened in, 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 in Philly, too. But at that time, that library was intact. So I go over in the shelf where I got all these young men in this big circle and I got the boom box here and we talking. We, I said, hold on for a minute, home show y'all something. And I pulled off the shelf a volume of the Journal of Negro History and I read something to them. And I said, let me pull off another one. I gave the book to somebody. You read this. You read now. What does that mean? Now we haven't, because I said, y'all in a building where you have a working brain here. And I said, I don't know how the last time anybody, any y'all ever, ever looked at that volume? No, I said, and that's when I told them, I went, I don't know, end the story. I went too long with it. I said, I got a volume just like this one. I said, I don't make enough money to go get it yet, but I'm working on it. I put down payment on it. So, you know, I'm going to get it. Probably take me, you know, maybe, you know, I don't know how long it's going to take me, but I'm, I'm going I'm to get it. Like two days later, I got a call from Flojo. She said, come back to the school. I ain't leave anything. She puts a check in my hand for $200. Hmm. What's this? She said, them boys went to her and said, Principal Johnson. Hmm. Get his doctor car. Tell him to put that on his books. So I'm just saying, when y'all look at black children, you have to understand. That they will meet whatever expectation you have. See, I, I don't cry about a lot of things. I usually cry about the future because I look at those children, and ain't none of them children now. That was 20, I was like 23 years ago. So they have children. <laughs> you understand? And I'm saying 
between that moment, if they had institutions where everybody was doing that, come on. What Woodson is saying in the miseducation of the Negro is, what are y'all doing? Instead of y'all going to meetings, trying to figure out, oh, Johns Hopkins has a new curriculum. Harvard has traveled. There's just some really good research about grit. And so they've been, shut the up. Get all these boys <laughs> copy of the miseducation of the Negro. Get in the room. Go around. Let them turn it into rhymes and get out of our way. We're yes. going to speak to each other without interpreters. Y'all are mad. And the only question I have when anybody comes with these new curriculum ideas, that's great. One question. What Do you have children? Yes. My second question. Yes. Would you give them this? If the answer is no, get the out of here. Because these are, to quote Lisa Delphit's book or the title, these are other people's children to you. You'll get to, I, we know how to educate our children. So what Woodson does in 1926 building on the momentum of memory that he's developing with this journal, building on the momentum of memory that he's building with the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History with people like his friend, Nanny Helen Burroughs. I've been talking about this, but I, I pulled the This is Nanny Helen Burroughs, who started the colored training school, manual training school for girls here in D.C. She was friends with Mr. Woodson. This is a documentary piece put together, edited by Kalisha Graves recently. And this is what uh, Nanny Burroughs says about her friend Carter Woodson. Carter G. Woodson, a Negro who began life as a laborer in the coal mines of West Virginia, founded the National Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. In the mines, he learned to dig for what he wants. Mm. The international institution is the result. Without his organization, Negro contributions to history will be buried deeper and deeper among the forgotten deeds of men who have no facilities for preserving their life stories. Individual initiative and American opportunity did it. And so she goes on. She's hardcore Christian. She's like, because Woodson going to play this game, too. We'll talk about that. But the but reason, reason I bring this up is by 1926, Woodson, who has been in, this is why I say origin stories, you can make up different ones. Negro History Week isn't the first ritual Black people created in this country. There were rituals even here in D.C. Black women, she was a very important part of the Negro Club Women Movement. Um, there were rituals that they created to preserve memory, to extend memory that no doubt influenced Woodson there uh was uh there was decoration day that became memorial day as we know we've talked about that last summer we talked about memorial day uh there was emancipation day uh certainly april here in dc uh, january 1st many other places uh juneteenth in the south so what negro history week does is woodson builds on that momentum and what he does is and let me just read from his celebration of negro history week uh article from 1927 where he's saying, let me just see if I can find, uh, because let me see if I can find here, because I didn't mark it. I didn't pull, ironically, like a lot of things, my my, my physical volumes of the J&H are in storage because they take up a lot of space. But uh, anyway, no, I, 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 you know, I know it, so I'll gloss it. What Wilson says is we started this week as a brief moment. And it was Negro History Week. He had the birthdays of Lincoln and Douglas, as we know, in the second week of February. That was the week. To do several things. The, the segregated schools, where they're teaching Negro history, and we're encouraging them to do that, in spite of the fact they won't give money for books. Whatever. We started the association to write the children's books, to absorb the material, and then to get it back out to those schools, and to connect with those teachers, and then to absorb what they're doing back into the association, to basically organize. It's the, the, the Asala is an organization of, of organizers. So it isn't based on university scholars, although there are plenty of university scholars in it. Unfortunately, now the, the mix isn't nearly what it was in the early days. It was churches. It was fraternal and sororal lodges. It was the Negro uh, K-12 segregated schools. It was community groups. And that's how you build this, what he called the Black history, well, the Negro history movement. Well, after a decade, they were sufficiently had enough momentum, along with some grants from foundations, and it, which all dry up by the time he's writing the Miseducation of the Negro. We talked about that in, in, in Nubia, how this money dried up because Woodson refused to turn the association over to any institution that he didn't feel was grounded in the black community. So, for example, the General Education Board, which is Rockefeller, you know, Carnegie, 
had given him grants. These small grants keep him going. You know, he could pay his salary. He could stop working at HBCUs. He had worked at Howard for a year. Couldn't take the white president and the Negro bureaucracy. Let me get the hell out of here. He had gone to West Virginia uh, State College and been a dean there for a while. But then he gets enough grant money from these cats so that he doesn't have to do that. And he just goes on Ninth Street and he builds the association. But then he applies again and he has clearly the best proposal. If this was about merit, black people would be rich from these foundations, right? We'd have institutions, but here's the string. Here's the catch. The next round, by the early 30s, they tell him, we're not going to give you no more money until you affiliate with an institution. He said, well, I have an institution. Yes, but he, what they what GEB and them were saying, and it was a white boy named Thomas Jesse Jones, and we talked about that newbie, but I won't get into that here because uh, his stuff, he did stuff on the Negro education in the United States, in Africa, because then, of course, what Whitson writes about is in the Miseducation Negro, these people who are setting up what becomes apartheid. 33 is 15 years before 1948 when the National Party comes in with the apartheid, the formal apartheid after they've already done the dispossession of land and all that kind of stuff in South Africa. He said, but they're traveling to the United States to see what y'all do to us so they can replicate it in the colonies. I mean, he, he's writing that in the miseducation. Don't you see how your miseducation is now going to be used? And he said, and I'm not telling you just from theory, because Woodson spent a few years in the Philippines watching them try to do the same thing there. And we talked about in Nubia how he said, as a teacher, what I saw was the Americans came in trying to talk about apple trees and George Washington. These Filipinos who they're trying to colonize are looking at them like, I ain't never seen no apple. He said, all you got to do is listen to what they're saying, listen to their culture, understand them. And then when you begin to develop curriculum and instruction, you can better help them meet their needs. But that's not what they want. They want colonial education. And so anyway, I'm saying I have to say that Woodson gets cut off because he says the foundations tell him, well, we give most of our money when we give it to Negroes, we give it to the Negro colleges. And he said, they told him, if you will affiliate your association and let it be housed on a campus of a HBCU and, you know, let them kind of, you know, absorb you into their uh, apparatus, then we will give you money. Wilson looked at them and said, yeah, that's exactly why I don't want your money. And so, because <laughs> see, you think you got them schools on lock because you got them on the titty. So therefore, you want me to bring, hell no, I'm not about to do this. So what does he do? From the from the early 30s, from miseducation, 33, 34 on, Woodson grounds his fundraising efforts predominantly. Although from the beginning they were doing this, he ups the ante and says, turns to black community and says, we always been asking for nickels and dimes and dollars and school children and, and, and elders and all this kind of thing and churches and fraternities and sororities and, 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 and the Elks and the Masons and the Order Eastern Star and Daughters of Isis. Guess what? Uh, Ms. Burroughs, you know, my friend, Dr. Bethune. Yeah, you good at this, right? Okay, come in a uh, National Council of Negro Women and Club Women. Look, I ain't getting into no internecine beef between anybody, but I need all of y'all. Look, help me raise this money. And Woodson is depending on us, just like what we're doing with Nubian Narrative. Now, how does that relate to Negro History Week? He already had some experience with this, as I said. He's always been in raised money. The members of Omega Psi Phi fraternity come to Woodson. And they offer him honorary membership. Because when Woodson graduated from Berea in Kentucky, he wasn't no cues. Just like Freddie Douglas never went to college. And when Du Bois came out of Fisk, there weren't no any alphas. Fisk or Harvard. So in that, as the fraternities and sororities come into existence, 1904, Sigma Pi Phi, 1906, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha, 1908, Alpha Kappa Alpha, Alpha, uh, and so forth. 1911, Omega Psi Phi, so forth. The Devil Sigma Theta, I think, 1913. I mean, so forth. You go on Zeta Phi Beta, you know, Sigma Gamma Rho, you know, you know, Phi Beta Sigma, you name Kappa Alpha Psi. Uh, one of the only ones that's founded on a white college campus, uh, Indiana University, but very quickly then gets a Negro college campus. And then many years later, of course, Ida Phi Theta, the so-called Divine Nine. You get this group. Well, those first ones start going back and claiming famous Negroes. <laughs> you know, who 
who, who weren't in school or didn't go to school came out of slavery and making them honorary members. So, you know, as my my, uh, my Jigna, Jacob Carruthers used to say when he was at Hudson Tillerson College, he said they used to clown the Alphas with the tune of uh, Glory Hallelujah. And they would sing, the Alphas, they were desperate. They were running out of men. So they dug up Frederick Douglass and they made him live again. I mean, <laughs> I mean they clown these cats, man, because they said, oh, Frederick Douglass is an honorary Alpha. Freddie Douglass was under the lash. Cat. It wasn't no Greek letter. I mean, Du Bois, they made an Alpha. They made... So the Q's come get Woodson. Woodson's like, bet, I'm with y'all. One condition, what? I'm going to need y'all to help me with this new project I got. All right, bro, what is it? Something called Negro History Week. They were like, okay, we down. To this day, to evoke the spirit of Deontay Wilder, to this day, <laughs> the Q's are intimately involved with the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History because Carl G. Woodson is their frat brother and every birthday of Woodson, every birthday celebration that second Saturday in December when they have the ritual. They did it virtually this year and last year, obviously, but you know when you meet down there by Woodson's house at the school around the corner, the cues are on guard. They're the ushers, uh, the basilisk, if he's in town, speaks. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see those brothers in the purple and gold, sons of blood and thunder. I ain't mad at them. They're there doing the thing because Woodson is their man. And, and to restore the house, which the National Park Service came, uh, uh, pushed, um, shout out to Eleanor Holmes Norton, the delegate here in D.C. who worked for Cong with Congress, the brothers and sisters who were at the National Park Service at the highest level, um, who, who pushed all that through. Omega Psi Phi took on the leadership of raising community money and they raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to restore and then that money got emptied into the coffers and equally if not more important because we pay tax dollars people say the government giving money i we gave the government money stop saying free y'all stop saying y'all want to go to free college did you pay your taxes yes well then that ain't free that's your money would you rather go to you or go to uh uh, uh mcdonald douglas for another damn plane or go to donald trump for his security detail give me my money i don't give a damn what happens to you so anyway the point is that the Q's took that on. And so what Woodson understood with Negro History Week, that it wasn't just about spreading awareness. It was about strengthening the community networks so that we could turn inward and prove our capacity to do for ourselves. So it also became fundraising. It wasn't just. For, and the last thing I say about the origins of it in that regard is that Woodson writes about this. And then we'll see if I can find it, because when he publishes this in 1927, Celebration of Negro History Week, what has just happened? And in fact, I'll. I'll, I'll uh, let me see if I can find it here. Because one of his friends, yes, he says the outstanding event, because this is what he says. He says, as you spread awareness, people will say, well, what, what can we do about it? And he, now he's talking about white places. He says, one of the things you can do is put black books in your libraries. He says, the effort assumed also the form of placing on the shelves of libraries books presenting the leading facts of Negro history. To the management of these institutions, these workers have presented carefully prepared lists of useful and scientific books recently produced by some of the best scholars in the country. Why is that important? What the association did also is served as a think tank and as a place to organize intellectual labor. So Woodson, people working with Woodson, and I was just rereading, in fact, oh man, oh no, what did I do with it? I had it right here. And I moved it. Lorenzo Johnson Green, because I was reading something else. I was reading a critique of the 1619 Project by James Oakes, which has some very interesting observations, but also is wrong about a lot of other stuff. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Uh, Lorenzo Green is one of the people that Oakes mentions, the Negro in colonial New England. This is actually a, uh, this is a, it's Columbia University Press, 1942. Studies in History, Economics, and Public Law, The Negro in Colonial New England, 1620 to 1776. Lorenzo Green was one of them cats. He was at Lincoln University, HBCU. These scholars and then students coming up behind them will compile these lists and stuff. So when these libraries and these institutions will come, well, I don't know. Is there enough stuff? In uh, bam! Here you go. Here the list. So the association was important as a kind of a think tank. And so what Woodson says is these librarians have been told that in order to make the institution one serving the whole public, they must circulate the literature which presents the record of all groups. In the case of an excuse to the effect that the libraries lack funds, 
some of these agencies have actually raised money to purchase books, which they have placed in these institutions. It is more encouraging to know, however, that a large number of libraries themselves, favorably impressed with the appeal for literature bearing upon this neglected aspect of our history, have made considerable purchases of books on the Negro from their regular library funds. And then he goes on to list some of the books they can buy and turn and also subscribe to Journal of History. Now, what's now, now this is this is part of this Negro history movement. What is Woodson doing? What are the people in the association doing? What are the people influenced by the people in the association doing? What are the people who are also in the movement, but not directly connected to the association doing? They're driving the public to bust up in the school, to bust up in the public library and say, yeah, I know it's library segregated, but where the black books? Where the black books? Where the black books? And what you keep doing now, now here, here's the thing. You walk down the street, man, I ain't got time to read all these books. Look, this is all I want you to do. Go in there and ask for the, uh, go in there and ask for the education of the Negro prior to 1861. Huh? Repeat after me. The education of the Negro, the education of the Negro, prior to, prior to 1861, 1861. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Spike Lee told Ozzie Davis to do the right thing. I got it. I'm gone. <laughs> so they're going up in there. He, they're driving people into the libraries asking for these books. Now the people say, yeah. now, well, where are we going to get these books? And drop Woodson and his crew. Here go the list. Here go the list. Here go the list. Now, I'll end with this on this point. This is the next paragraph. He says, the outstanding event of this sort was the recent purchase of the A.A. A. Schomburg collection of 4,000 books on the Negro. The necessary fund was given by the Carnegie Corporation and the books were placed in the 135th branch, Street branch of the New York Public Library and a special department established exclusively for reference and research in Negro life and history. During the first few months, which the collection has been thus available for public use, it has been given stimulus to the study of the Negro in that quarter who have decidedly aided the effort to celebrate Negro History Week in New York. Woodson was his friend. They were both in the American Negro Academy. If y'all want to read Alfred Moss's book on that, I mean, there's it's not been enough written on that, but I want to tie that in a second to even Jamie Williams and Bishop uh, um, Ransom and for, for this reason, and I'll just name it here and then we'll talk more about it maybe in a minute. The original name of the American Negro Academy, uh, and it's attested to Paul Dunbar, out of Dayton, who was friends with Bishop Ransom, by the way, man. Uh, there was some talk of maybe calling it the African uh, Society or the African Academy, but they didn't. They called it the American Negro Academy. But, but, but Woodson and, and Woodson and, and, and Schomburg were both members of the American Negro Academy. And Lane Locke, you know, uh, yeah. But anyway, I'll talk about the American Negro Academy another day. The Schomburg Center we have today has its roots in the demand that is being driven by these regular black folk who are being pulled together. In other words, we have institutional power. Now imagine that we all boycotted the Super Bowl. You Negroes might get some black coaches, maybe a black owner, but you ain't gonna do that because <laughs> it hurts you too much and your team is in the bowl this game. So you, so in other words, you know, you extend your slavery by acting like a slave. Mm. So, I mean, it's that, it's not, I mean, Douglas said that he who is whipped oftenest uh, no, he said, he who is whipped easiest is whipped oftenest. <laughs> so in other words, I mean, if you're going to keep taking these ass whippers, we're going to keep giving them to you. Well, they won't hire a black coach because you won't stop watching. So, uh, and anyway, um, but but what's in it, you know, the Schomburg is there in part because of black demand. And the reason I said that tied to uh, Ransom, who was, of course, one of the Jagnas of Jamie Williams, um, and McDonald Williams and so many others there around Wilberforce and beyond in the AME Church is because the the first when they when when Wilberforce was handed over to the AME Church they purchased Wilberforce from the Methodist Church the white Methodists making it the oldest private black college in the country. Uh, there was some talk of naming it at the AME Church banded this about the African University. How I wish. They would have named it that. They then named it in honor of William Wilberforce, the British abolitionist. But I'm like, man, can you imagine that? Where'd you go to school? I went, I went to school at AU. Oh, American University? No, the African University in mm. Ohio. <laughs> it's like, but anyway, but but anyway, I mean, yeah. So so Schauberg and 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 so that's that's kind of some of the origins of what became in 1976 federally with Gerald Ford. Uh, doing something that black people had already expanded it to a month years before the association for the state of Negro life and history pushed for this after they changed their name to the, uh, the association for the state of Afro-American life and history. This conversation began in the 1960s. It was kind of generational Rayford Logan and them boys who were Woodson's cats 
Logan loved the word Negro with a capital N. And Woodson makes this point. He said, we're not from Africa. We talked about that. It's in the miseducation of the Negro. He was strictly demographic about that. Remember in that Latin, that first appendix, much ado about a name. He says, Afro-American mean you were born in Africa, you came here. African mean you were born in Africa. Negro, that's us here. He said, but we don't even need to worry about that because what a thing is, is more important than what you call it. Mm. Okay, so he gets real, you know, it's, I mean, and, and hey, we wouldn't all agree on that. I would say, no, nah, we're going to call ourselves African, but I'm in 2022. So I'm not mad at Carter Woodson. I understand his logic. It makes perfect sense. But I'm just saying that they, they had that battle in the association. And it was a lot of it was intergenerational. Larry Crow actually was at the meeting the year after they had the big fight. And then they met in Cincinnati and they switched over to Afro-American life and history. Now it's African-American life and history. And then they had already begun expanding the, uh, the celebration to the whole month of February. So anybody out there saying you know, they gave us the shortest month of the year, they didn't give us anything. We gave ourselves that through Woodson and then we expanded it. And then they made it a federal holiday in 1976. Or they reckon federal uh, resolution, the uh, presidential declaration. They recognized Negro history. Was well, there a lot of pushback? Were there white organizations mad that this, uh, that Gerald Ford, you know, decreased? Oh, sure. Of course. Of course. Of course. I mean, just like everybody always meant, look, when you got a good slave that walks off the plantation, you mad. <laughs> I mean, George Washington tried, he was writing letters. I love how he was writing letters to own a judge, like, come back. And she was like, <laughs> this dude, I mean, I wish, see, you know, Erica Dunbar Nelson has written about her recently. Uh, but if you study African American history, then you we've known about Ona Judge for a long time. Shout out to the Avengers, the Avenging the Ancestors Coalition in in uh, Philadelphia. My man Mike Cord and them boys, and the sisters and brothers who for years protested down in front of Liberty Bell and Independence Hall because they were going to re uh, imagine the president's house where the first U.S. presidents lived, George Washington and them, and they had us enslaved down there. Hercules, Ona Judge, and all them. Hercules the cook on a judge who Martha Washington had, and they would send them back to Virginia just at the time. Because in Pennsylvania, if you stayed beyond a certain uh, number of months, if you were enslaved, you were freed. So they would wait till like the week before the, the month limit was up and send them back to Mount Vernon for a day or two, or a week or two, and then bring them back so they could start. Well, on a judge got the hell out of Dodge. She was in New England. Hercules ran off too. And so uh, when you go to Philadelphia, if, if those of you who've been and seen that exhibit now, because you got black all over it now, you got the Liberty Bell and the new pavilion, then you got the president's house and you just see all these Africans, Hercules on a judge, all of it there. You take your children and go say, man, they did a good job on this. They were black. He was a sister who was over the, the region for the National Park Service who was in the fight. My Jagna, the great Charles Bloxon had been writing about this stuff since the seventies, inheriting it from generations that came before him, like Charles Wesley and them, uh, my man at Morgan State, what's the brother's name? Oh, I see him. Uh, Benjamin Quarles. Uh, he's, I mean, they've been doing this work for years. But then in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, when it became clear they were going to revive this, the community of Black Philadelphia, they came out in force. We used to go down there and protest to my friend school kids down there one time. We were down there, red, black, and green flags. Y'all ain't building it up in here if y'all going to until y'all deal with us. And so they got it right. They had to get it right, because as Woodson said, this ain't about Negro history, it's about the Negro in history. You're not going to do this and whitewash this again. This cat was an enslaver. And I said, I had to say that um, there was a lot of pushback at that point. But, you know, that's because just like on a judge went to New England and George Washington writing from Virginia, like, come back. And I offer this reward to people. But it was white people in Massachusetts, white people in Maine, white people in, no. No, she ain't coming back down there. For what? And then she wrote him like, I'll come back if you promise to free me, my children. We'll sit and talk about it. It was like, what? George Washington can go to hell. Well, I'm sorry. Why should I ask somebody to go somewhere they already are? The point is this. <laughs> the <laughs> But Woodson, writing from the shadow of slavery in the middle of Jim Crow, has this to say about George Washington, we talk about pushback. This is from the 1941 issue of the Negro History Bulletin, which he started in 1937, primarily for school teachers and children. I keep saying people all the time, if you wanna see something that will inspire you to do different places, do different things, 
read the pages of the Negro History Bulletin. But I mean, when I say read the history, they still publish it, it's the Black History Bulletin. But I mean, read the pages from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. 60s too. By the 70s, yeah, sure, the 70s. But the closer you get to now, the more you see the effects of miseducation and diseducation. Those earlier articles, there's nothing that has been published in curriculum. There's nothing that will be published this year on a mass scale that can touch the hem of the garment of the Negro History Bulletin during the 1930s and 40s. When I tell you, imagine giving the children in your school the assignment of researching the name of the school and then writing articles about it. Imagine giving your children, you can do that today, but people say, oh no, but they want to, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get them to do a rhyme. No, no, we're not going to get them to do a rhyme. We're going to get them to do some research and turn it into a written article. And it's, they're going to edit it. And you're going to show them how to edit. You're going to show them how to edit for content. You're going to show them how to edit for grammar. You're going to show them how to edit and see where the gaps are. You're going to say, or you could just get to them and them turn into a rhyme. And then, and so you want to know why they can get you to dance at the Super Bowl. Why? Because as Wilson says in the Miseducation of the Negro, we have artists. He said, we got musicians, we got poets, we got dancers. He said, but they must receive institutional training and guidance. He's not talking about going to the conservatory. Leotine Price was a student of Jamie Coleman Williams at Wilberforce. She did her first three years at Wilberforce, and then they had a fight in the early 40s. This was the fight that created the school we know as Central State University. The state of Ohio was trying to take over Wilberforce. They had some Negro politicians in Ohio that wanted to help them do it. And then the AME Church gets involved, and the president at that time of Wilberforce was Charles Wesley. He was the one that hired Jamie Williams and her husband, Matt Williams. These are stories I heard mouth to ear. And they fired Charles Wesley right before commencement. He gets up at commencement and says, it's all right, we're going to keep going because we got the uh, the uh, vocational ed division across the street that we've already built, and we're going to call it Wilberforce State. Wilberforce State? What is Wilberforce State? Y'all don't get to call, uh, Wilberforce is a name that we share. So we're going to, they go to court. These are black people in court. They arguing in court in Ohio. And Dr. Williams tells the story of how um, she McDonald Williams, all the people from Wilberforce go up to the meeting. Charles Leander Hill was the president at the time of Wilberforce. Charles Leander Hill, by the way, y'all look up Charles Leander Hill. He was the first person to translate Anton Wilhelm Amo's uh, dissertation. Anton Wilhelm, Wilhelm Amo was the first African to get a PhD in Europe. He writing about the slave trade. Very interesting. I mean, it's just an interesting fact. But he translated from Latin into English. Said, really? Yeah. This is the excellence of black people. Wilberforce was the leading black school in many ways. Now, you went to Lincoln University out there in the Midwest. They say they were the leading school. Now, if you came to Howard, they say they are the, when you go to Fisk, they are the leading school. My point is, these are black school. Now, it's cute. Oh, they help give you a sense of home and pride. No, we talk about intellectual warfare. At the height of Jim Crow. Anyway, I, I'm, I just put that footnote in, coming back to the point I was getting ready to make that uh, they lost the case to people who wanted to have Wilberforce State. Charles Wesley goes over and founds, however, the black, the public HBCU in Ohio, and that's where Central State came from, the split in the AME Church over the fate of Wilberforce. So Wilberforce continues, and, and then right across the street, those of you who've been down there know that, that Central State is down there. But when Central State was created, the music department went over there from Wilberforce, which is why Leotine Price uh, who went to Wilberforce, was a student of the Williamses and others at Wilberforce, did her first three years at Wilberforce and then transferred over to Central State to finish. And so she's a graduate of Central State because the music department went over there. Uh, the head of the music department at that time, who was at Wilberforce, then at Central State, was friends with Paul Robeson, uh, who put Leotine Price on when he would come sing in Dayton and things like that. And I said, I had to say this. Leotine Price, what Woodson is saying in the Miseducation of the Negro is, if she want to sing opera, good. But if you want to write poetry, if you want to do other things coming out of our culture, good. But you should have some people around you that help develop your capacity to do it. You shouldn't just have to do it with just your people, just your peers. Because, see, if you do that, uh, well, you know, there lived a little boy who was misled by another little boy. What do you think gangster rap came from? There's no intergenerational training. So you take all that gift. And you say, well, let me see, what am I going to say? <laughs> oh, it was once said by a man who couldn't stop. Don't man please me. I 
Oh, no, it was one said by a man who couldn't quit. Dope man, please. May I have another hit? Boy, that Ryan, that's kind of it. Yeah, but you ain't got no old hair. So do you really want to? Okay, now what else is next? Well, the next couplet, I would say the dope man said, yeah, so no, wait, no, wait, stop. All right, let's let's just look at this from just the ethical frame. I don't want to, you know, get in way your creativity and you got to tell it like it is. But what is your ultimate objective? What are you driving people to? Because, I mean, in fact, let's just go read reread a few more pages from Native Son. Well, guess what? You ain't got no institution to do that. What Woodson is saying is if you don't do that, this is what Woodson, and he says this in the Men's Education. If you don't have institutions, guess what's going to happen? Those people who you have distanced yourself from, they're going to keep creating. Except what they create will not serve them. And it won't serve anybody else. He's predicting what's going to happen when institutions are displaced. And so his position is ultimately this will contribute to a different kind of country, which reads me. And this is where I was going with that in terms of George Washington. I ain't got nothing to, you know, I have no time for George Washington. I have no time for Washington. He's, well, he's a man of his age. Yeah, and in his age, you'd be out there with your shirt off picking cotton. Clarence Thomas, my man. Well, what did the founders want? The founders wanted your black ass to be picking tobacco. So you're talking about strict constructionists, which we all know is, is, is a legal fiction. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you three-fifths of a Negro down there in the Geechee Gullah territory. But, uh, <laughs> you know, really? We're going to talk about original construction? But in his defense, he would come back with, well, they have the 14th Amendment. And I would say, that's very generous, and you're absolutely right. So you should probably read the 14th Amendment the way the architects of the 14th Amendment intended it, which included a congressman named John Hingham, who was called the James Madison of the 14th Amendment, who paid Rev uh, 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 um, Reverdy Cassius Ransom's mother, paid her $5 gold piece for the honor of naming her son. That's crazy. It's 1861. This is the guy who was in many ways the intellectual architect of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, the equal protection due process one, the one that's been damn near interpreted out of existence by a rogue ass Supreme Court as early as the civil rights cases in 1883 or even Cruikshank, 1872. But anyway, 73. But the point is that he paid this sister whose people had come originally from Virginia there in Ohio and the baby was named um, Reverdy, which I think he took from the Latin, Cassius. You can't make this up, Professor Hunter. Cassius after Cassius Clay mm. in Louisville, in Kentucky. The same Cassius Clay that Muhammad Ali was named for. Ransom. Reverdy Cassius Ransom. And Reverdy Ransom writes about this in the book that he wrote, his autobiography, because he lived to 98 years old. Mm. This demand that gave Jamie Coleman Williams her scholarship to go to Wilberforce. Reverend e. Ransom, we have we have to do it. You should know. In fact, I'm gonna come back to him in a second, but I will just finish this point I'm trying to make as it relates to Woodson as it comes to this question of institution building, the importance of institution building. Um, yeah, let me just let me just stop with that. I'll come back to ransom in a minute. But my point was going to be that you know, Reverend e. Ransom was named by one of the major architects of the 14th Amendment. So when Clarence Thomas might say, Yeah, I'm a strict constructionist, I would say, Good, then strictly construct the 14th Amendment. Because if you read the conference notes, you'll understand that the way y'all interpret it is very much more narrow than they meant it. So if you want to be original, be original, bruh. Everybody, in fact, y'all go if y'all want to know about Clarence Thomas, go get Corey Lamont's book, The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. He breaks it down on who this guy is. Shout out to his wife, Jenny. I don't know if you saw the recent New Yorker with the article by Jane Mayer, how this, this one is out there, man. Shout out to Jenny, a real white nationalist, you know, and all that money you poured into December, uh, February, uh, January the 6th. You really doing your job, Jenny. Uh, I don't want, you know, anyway. But what I was going to say, though, is the idea then that George Washington is a person of his time. So let me just pull this while I'm thinking about it. This is the, uh, this is the new New Yorker. Um... Jenny Thomas's Crusades is the first article in there. She, read Joan Mayer, uh, Jane Mayer. Jane Mayer is the one did thing on dark money and the Koch brothers and all that. But I am much less, I'm much less charitable toward George Washington as are so many more people than Woodson was. This is what Woodson is saying about George Washington as it relates to the critics who would be critical of him in Negro History Week and black anything in terms of education to answer your question. He does a question and answer in 1937 in the Negro History Bulletin about Negro History Week. And the first question is, should Negroes emphasize the celebration of George Washington's birthday during February when they are concentrating largely on the achievements of their own people? 
Woodson writes, certainly Negroes should give much attention to the celebration of George Washington's birthday and all other holidays which are set apart to inculcate an appreciation of the achievements of the fathers of the Republic and instill patriotism. The United States is the native land of the blacks as well as the whites and everything that pertains to the country at large should concern the Negroes. They are Americans of the first order. Neither they nor their immediate forebears were born abroad. The Negroes were born here in this country and are not hyphenated Americans. You can imagine what he would say about African Americans, right? Negroes do not enjoy all the rights and privileges which belong to them according to the laws and constitution of the country, but they have made progress in this direction. And with this, to encourage them, they will struggle on for full recognition as citizens. That does not mean losing your institutions. Again, this stuff has to be re read nuanced, right? He says, Washington, for the reason that he believed with Kosciuszko, who we talked about in the grip of Hull and them boys, Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, that slavery was an evil which should be exterminated. Technically, that's true on Jefferson, even though he didn't let nobody go. Woodson comes next and says, Washington was not an abolitionist but he expressed his desire to have slavery abolished by legislation. That is by making, by the action of the lawmaking bodies of the states as it was done by some Northern states during his day. He set a noble example in providing in his will that his slaves should be freed. Now we know the other part of that story that George Washington married in the money. Martha the one had him enslaved. He could put that in his will, but she outlived him. And guess what? Ain't none of y'all going nowhere. <laughs> that's how them Negroes she gave to uh, was her daughter or granddaughter ended up over there after she after the granddaughter married into Rob, married Robert E. Lee and put the Washingtons and Lees together and they had a plantation called Arlington that's where the National Cemetery is now them Africans were enslaved out there he says now here's where it comes he says in, in, in emphasizing the history of the Negro moreover the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History is not encouraging any such thing as a neglect of any phase of American history the aim is merely to dig up and bring before the American people in general and the Negro in particular, that part of our history, which has been neglected. So I won't go on. He goes on and on. And then the next question he asked, uh, they ask him is, should Negroes honor Abraham Lincoln on the 12th of February, along with Frederick Douglass? And he gets into this whole conversation about Lincoln, his ambiguities, why he was good, why he was bad, all this kind of thing. Very interesting. The third question, what were the names of the Negroes who came with Columbus when he discovered America? Well, he now then he blows the 1619 project out of it water was good this is 1937 and then what is the origin of negro history week he talks about what i just talked about here but i'm saying i have to say this the pushback was coming from white insecurity to use the word you you, you remind us of a moment ago because woodson is saying my objective is not to segregate the history in fact my pure objective is to integrate the history y'all want to talk about integration no problem and here's the mind blower uh, I shouldn't say that. That's that, that. Unfortunately, for some, it'll blow their minds. Woodson don't start history with enslavement. So when he says integration, he's talking about world history. World history. In fact, uh, wh who was I? Uh, what class was this? Oh, it was my introduction to African American States class. Last week, uh, I introduced something. Uh, I showed them a clip of something from the history makers and one of the people being interviewed was like i took european history and i took world history oh jacob carruthers he said i took european history in high school college i took world history high school college he said and in all them cases i couldn't tell the difference <laughs> he said what they call world history class is european view of the world what Woodson, Woodson introduces at the end of the 1930s, a book he worked on, Rayford Logan and some others called The African Background Outlined. It is literally a curriculum framework and then chapters on how to begin to think about black people in world history. The African Background Outline. And if you remember, when we read The Miseducation of the Negro, he basically states his whole philosophy of curriculum. Where, in fact, I'm going to find that quote in a minute. I'm going to pause here and you, you jump back in because I'm going to find that quote. But I, I was just making this point. The pushback then and now is from, is from people who want to preserve white nationalism as the organizational logic of U.S. society and world and global society. We don't want the full history of humanity. We want the history of the white advance toward greatness. 
And any and Woodson never said this is we just gonna talk about black people too, black people. No, we're gonna start in this community, preserve and extend this community, be fully human citizenship and participation in global humanity. And from there, we speak to the world and everybody advance. We don't want that. We want your ass singing, dancing, running, shooting jump shots. You know, we need you out there scoring touchdowns. We want to hear you sing and dance, and not you, Esther, because you. No, you, you okay. Yeah. And if you want to know how degraded that becomes, you can celebrate a sister who a man ripped her whole top off. And then she get crucified and he go on to continue to play blackness. <laughs> so the whole point, and guess what? He wasn't even hurt. I mean, come on. At Kenny. all. No. At all. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to look that quote up if I can put okay. it. All right. And, you know, as as we push towards Super Bowl, I'm still like baffled why people are still watching. And I I, I don't know what it's going to take, you know, for us. Oh, to... it's, we're gonna, we're gonna have, we haven't suffered enough. We haven't suffered enough. Or maybe Ooh. we've gotten so used to being boiled one degree at a time that we don't know what suffering is. You know, that, maybe, maybe we've gotten it's gotten comfortable. Suffering is our our, our, our baseline. That's our our due north. And and that's really sad. <laughs> if that if that yeah. is the case, if that if we're so used to suffering that we will we'll accept anything. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's it's interesting, you know, as we sit here in this space, uh, the 99th episode heading to 100, um, 100 times we've come together to do this and we're building out this space simultaneously called narrative. You know, it's interesting. You know, when we talk about people bringing bricks, yeah. how how far it is for a lot of people to even imagine building something like this mm. and their participation in it. That, you know, but Carter G. Woodson, when you started tearing up about the kids, Man. it was the kids that gave him a nickel. And I remember this story what? that you told us a year ago, <laughs> and it was the thing that inspired narrative. Because mm. if we could put five on it, mm -hmm. you know, if we could put five on it, meaning we can bring our brick, meaning we can invest in the future of something, yeah. even if we're not here to see it, Yes. Then there's hope for this thing, you know, and it's not even about America. It's about humanity at this point. It's not about preserving America. It's yeah. not about black people building something in America. It's about us reclaiming humanity That's for right. the future. That's right. That's right. We have no choice. We have no choice. If, I'm so glad you said that because I was uh, reading an earlier issue of the, uh, the New Yorker. I'm hoping I can find. I don't think it was in the one I just showed y'all. This was this yesterday. I mean, I'm constantly reading stuff and I think I might have. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Joshua, Joshua Rothman. It is in the new issue. It's called Best Case Scenario. I, I didn't know this author, but I may go start reading some of his stuff. The Climate Change Science Fiction of Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, Joshua Rothman wrote a long piece in the New Yorker. This, this week's New Yorker. And to what you just observed. This guy Robinson apparently is a hiker. They went out in the mountains of California, Big Sur, and they hiking and they're having this conversation. Guy has a PhD. Uh, he's constantly going to climate science meetings and, and, and conventions and conferences. And he's working in, in his science fiction. All the science in there has been vetted. Scientists send him ideas on how to, you know, can we create carbon credits because they're trillions of dollars of, of carbon, of oil. Uh, deposits that these countries and these private comp companies have control over. If they dig it up, if they use even 10% of it, it's going to finish what we're doing here. Because once you create an acidity level beyond which the life at the bottom of the ocean can't survive, it don't even matter if you do everything else. You've already killed yourself. You're just waiting to die as a species, as a, as a planet. So anyway, he writes all that in the science fiction. But to, to your observation, we're all going to die. As, as as Curtis Mayfield said, if there's hell below, we all going to go. So, you know, so then he says, you know, while you're doing all that and Nixon talking about don't worry, I say, don't worry. You know, there will be no show. You know, if it's hell below, we all going to go. These contributions aren't just about saving a particular group. Although, oh, and you see, you see our sister down there in Barbados then jumped out there again. First of all, <laughs> she won re-election. Oh, yes. Last <laughs> Nehemiah, and now she's moving into this environmental thing where she's giving them hell. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She said, My country and all these countries around here that are at the sea level, they are not going to go underwater. We ain't gonna die for y'all. And guess what? You're gonna die too. 
So she's jumping. And in fact, what she says is, I'm not going to be a politician the rest of my life. I think I'm going to move beyond that. So now there's speculation that she going to the UN and she going to lead the climate science charge. But this is what happens when you have an institution you control, in this case, a country. So American Negroes, like Woodson is saying, we here. So you should try to influence the country. And as we're looking at this, you know, Supreme Court pick, uh, Justice Supreme Court, he's saying, well, it's not going to change the composition of the court. It's still going to be 6-3. Yeah, we're going to put the black woman on there. I don't know if it's Kentaji Brown Jackson. I don't know if it's a sister on the California Supreme Court now. Uh, I don't know if it's the second person, uh, uh, Justice Ch Judge Childs, who hasn't been confirmed yet for the D.C. Court of Appeals, would be the second black woman put on there. Uh, I don't know who it will be. We don't know who it will be. I even heard Stacey Abrams' sister, who is a federal judge in Georgia. Her, uh, you know, she was appointed to the bench. She's been on the bench now for a few years. She, she's she been put in the mix. I heard Sherilyn Eiffel uh, put on the bench, uh, put, on, put, put, put in the list. And, you know, I, I think ultimately, and I was talking to uh, Angie about this because, you know, she court watcher, of course. And, and she, Angie Porter. Yeah, Angie Porter. And, and she clerked for, you know, she clerked in the federal circuit for judge, federal judges, too. Two black men, in fact. And so, you know, I think her hesitation is my, I share her hesitation. You know, Sonia Sotomayor was a, was a, was appointed at a moment. And we all knew, I mean, Barack Obama wasn't going to pick nobody black. For, see, you got to be, you got to think black. <laughs> to pick, and that, that was never. I know, I know y'all don't like me coming for Obama, but if you don't like it, you should probably show me something to the contrary because I'm basing this on something Thanks. other than just my feelings. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. You really have to understand. But he did put Sonia Sotomayor on, and as, and as I often remind people, as long as you're using a social stru structure logic, you think Sonia Sotomayor is only Boricua, but she, her, she from the Bronx by way of Puerto Rico. And when you look at her parents, particularly her mother, I'm saying there ain't nobody in Puerto Rico, damn it. They ain't got no, that has no black blood. I'm saying y'all need to, if her name was Sonia Johnson, you, you, you wouldn't even, hey, we wouldn't even have this conversation. But that Spanish gets to your ear and messes you up. I would encourage you to go back and read Carter Woodson and read those scholars because they wouldn't start at 1619. It ain't even about the number 1619. It's about the idea that in raising 1619, you've cut yourself off from the African in the hemisphere which is why I'm going to read this piece from Woodson in a second. In other words, why do we focus on the Anglo-centric teaching of Black hemispheric history? That is that is the quintessential expression of American nationalism. And that's a problem. Now you just cut out uh, only about five and a half percent of every African who was who ended up on this side of the hemisphere, uh, this side of the globe during enslavement came directly to the United, what became the United States. Most of our ancestors came to the Caribbean first. And if you're going to shut yourself off from the Spanish and French Caribbean, not to mention the Dutch Caribbean, because you speak English and so you want to focus on Port Comfort, Virginia, stop it or not. We could just ignore it again or go back and reread the Negro History Bulletin. But the point I'm trying to make is this point I was coming to was this. When we think about these appointments to the court, I'm sure Woodson would say, You've got to understand we're here. So you have to participate. And my hesitation is that when Sotomayor was nominated, the Hispanic caucus got together, the elected officials, and they said, who are we going to push? Because the word was it's going to be a Latina or a Latino or Latinx or it's going to be somebody speak Spanish. And all those words like Asian. What the hell are you talking about? I mean, these social structure things, man, the language fails us. <laughs> you know, as Woodson said in the miseducation, the name is less important than what the thing is. But I mean, names are important, but, you know, but anyway, long story short, uh, Naya Velasquez, is it? The sister out of uh, New York, Congresswoman, uh, as, as it is reported, reached out among others, but she's most prominent in telling the story to the Congressional Black Caucus. Mel White at the time, North Carolina was, was in the Congress, CBC. And what the CBC said was, well, if it's not gonna be a black person, remember they know Barack Obama, who wouldn't even meet with them. Y'all don't, yeah, I know y'all love the man, but you should understand the man. Yeah, you know, black people be, mm -mm, don't do that. What's in, what's, in fact, Woodson got two chapters on that in terms of these political politicians. It's 1933 now. He ain't got nobody but Oscar the Priest and three other Negroes. It's before Adam Clayton Powell. I mean, so, I mean, Woodson don't tell you who they are. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they say, well, if it ain't going to be a black person, it ain't going to be a black person. We know that guy. 
the contempt he has shown. You know, my point is this: we back who y'all back. Safe form consensus. Remember her confirmation when she says, "Well, I hope what I bring to the branch a, a wise Latina might, you know, have." And then the white men went crazy. Because Sonia Sotomayor had been on the bench for a while. Uh, what's my man up there? The uh, Dapper Dan. Remember when he went when, uh, when Sonia Sanchez? Oh, Sonia Sanchez. Lord have mercy. I'm sorry, says Sonia. When Sonia Sotomayor was the police in New York, when she was on the bench up there, right? And uh, uh, he was doing something without a license, and she came in and told him, "Look, we're gonna have to shut you down if you don't do such and such." Anyway, they ended up being friends, and you know, ask Dapper Dan about Sonia Sotomayor. I mean, in other words. We are fortunate to have Soda Son Sonia Sotomayor on the bench, but I don't think Sonia Sotomayor could be confirmed today because her record was already established. It was a crack in the window in time. They eased her in there, but what you see now with judicial nominees, it's almost like they come out of the womb, in the delivery room, you look at them and say, we're going to groom you, and they say, ah, hold on, hold on. I don't want to cry too loudly because I don't want to offend anyone. So you start looking at their opinions. <laughs> you start looking at their public statements. See, they're not like the white nationalists. Amy Comey Barrett, the handmaid, been giving fire and brimstone speeches for years. You know, uh, Justice McConnell Gorsuch, he's been out there talking Justice Beer Kavanaugh. He been, they can do that. Alito and them, they go out and talk whoever they want because they have one single agenda, rule or ruin. They're going to do whatever. But if you black, you got to make sure you don't stink. Is that the right curl? Don't even wear no cologne. Ivory soap, ivory soap. Okay, what kind of hairstyle do you have? Okay, is natural hair is cool? Okay, I'm going to twist it, but it ain't going to be too, you know what I'm saying? Okay, let me get these right frame glasses. They have been coloring in the lines. And so that isn't to say, because it is a lifetime appointment. It isn't to say they can't change once they get there. But certainly since Bork, Robert Bork, the idea that the justices will not, uh, that the nominees will not answer questions has become an article of faith in judicial confirmations. And if you are not white, it's basically mother may eyes <laughs> from now on. But that's still better. And people say, well, it's not going to change the composition of the court. Yeah, we can all count. But here's the thing. And I don't know. We're going to see how this plays out because I, I don't really uh, Tell us, Kentanji um, Jackson, Kentanji Brown Jackson is married to uh, a surgeon whose twin brother is married to Paul Ryan's sister. Is it? Okay. <laughs> again, again, what? What? I mean, you know, and there's going to be a whole lot of arguments because, I mean, the sister out there in California, Kruger, I think, her mother came from Jamaica, father, white, Jewish, uh, Yale Law Review, Harvard. I remember when Sonia Sotomayor came to Howard Law School and we all went, Again, I've told you this story before. I won't go into it in detail. I just mentioned the highlight for me wasn't even what she said. The highlight for me was we all in the Howard University moot courtroom. I'm there as an adjunct member of the faculty. You know, I'm in the African States, but I'm honored to be on that faculty with my colleagues over there. I mean, this is for me in many ways the intellectual center of what I do at Howard and listening and really being in that conversation. Because, I, you know, we all, I went to law school for the same reason a lot of people go to law school. You can fight with ideas. Then you realize these people ain't worried about ideas. They worried about power. But it doesn't diminish the power of ideas. So I spent a lot of time with those students, a lot of time faculty members learning, you know. So I'm sitting in there with everybody else. It's packed. The place is packed. We're waiting on Soda Mayor. Then you realize she's late. You know, why would she be late? She got away. And then you realize where she is. She came in the building and stopped and talked to everybody. The custodial crew, the sisters in the cafeteria, and a lot of them sisters in the cafeteria, Latino. And she took pictures with all of them. She said, I'm the one that... Uh, y'all here to hear, so y'all can't start without me. And so my security detail and see everything, you know, y'all come on, we're gonna take these pictures. Can you imagine what that must feel like? You done bust your ass and came up here from Central America or the Caribbean somewhere. You worried about getting a good education. You take a job like that because there was a time when your children could go to the school, you know, with tuition, remission, this kind of thing. And then you see a sister who looks like you, who has your background and experience come into space. Shit. Will you take a picture? She's like, oh. No, I'm taking up. So when you think about Thurgood Marshall, don't be looking at the next person that you call black as the logical heir. Look at the spirit. As far as I'm concerned, I, rock, I, 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 I young people say I f's with a, but I rock, I rock with a, <laughs> I rock with Sonia Sanchez. I'm a Sonia Sotomayor. So anyway, but to what you're just just your observation about uh, Justice uh, Judge Brown Jackson, 
it ain't going to look like it looked like back in the day when Constance Baker Motley and uh, shout out to Tamiko Brown Nagin, who's up at Harvard, legal historian, who just published uh, the first book length uh, work on uh, uh, Constance Baker Motley that Constance Baker Motley didn't write because you, you can read Constance Baker, Constance Baker Motley, who was the first black federal judge um, uh, in the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, but yeah, so when you look at those, you have to understand that. And, and here's where I don't, I don't have any way because you can't really speculate and never underestimate the stupidity of uh, political parties. There is no party, as Reverend Barber would say, that fights for the poor, for the poor. It ain't the Democrats. You got justice Democrats trying to do things like that. But if they were smart. Well, I mean, if Barack Obama had nominated a black woman, you wouldn't have had Donald Trump. I'm convinced of that to this day. But, you know, that's Barack Obama. So, again. The point is, you know, let me go find, uh, oh, yeah, Justice Merrick Garland. He's the one. I mean, my God, I'm sure Woodson. Anyway, you really believe these people? No, did you just read my book? 1933. It's, it's old. You wasn't even, you know, your, anyway, your granddaddy was still in the village. Remember the cat, Oyamo, the cat that came back to the village in pants, and then everybody clowned him, and he clowned them and said, no, I'm going to be like the British. Yeah, that was your father's father. Yeah. So I think we probably seen this miseducation coming. Anyway, the point, the point, the point is this. If if they were to play this right, get her on the bench, they might be able to salvage a few seats in the midterm. Who knows? And they and they could use it as a plank when they when there's a the Democrats run for president in 2024. I'm not saying it's gonna be Biden, it might be Harris. Who knows? You don't know how, how much longer the mummy got. But uh it they could use this, but here's this is where I'm going with it. If they are able to retain the White House in 24. I'd be willing to bet to bet, you know, maybe a hundred of the hundreds of dollars I have in the bank that <laughs> Clarence Thomas is gonna be the next one. I mean, and he might go in the next four or five years. He's not gonna go before the elections, but I don't see the next person coming off that bench. And if that happens, it isn't six three anymore. It slides back to five four. And John Roberts, who really started a great deal of this end game we are in, not even with Shelby County versus Holder, but in 2010, Citizens United, which took the leash off of all that dark money that Jane Mayer been writing about before she this article here. This calculus could change. And to the point I'm making is Woodson's thing is we are here. We're going to tell our story. We're going to collect our story. We're going to propel our momentum. But we're doing that in part so that we can expand the concept of humanity so that some of these people who are just not stone cold racists can be brought into a greater awareness that our common humanity is no threat. In fact, it's the only way we're going to survive. And he's writing prior to World War II in the period between World War I and World War II in the interwar years at a point, at a moment when nation state nationalism has not yet peaked. Woodson makes transition in 1950, which means he doesn't even really live to see the anti-colonial explosion. He dies five years before Bandung Conference. Robert's board, no, Bandung, much more important. The year of Africa, 1960, where you, Nigeria and all these other countries take their independence, the Caribbean in, independence movement. Woodson's not there physically for that. He got to see that as an ancestor. But in 1933, he's prefiguring what's going to come. And so this is where I, 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 that, I found it. It is in the chapter called, uh, the one, you know, we're talking about Understand the Negro, which is chapter 13. Woodson writes this in one paragraph. This is a philosophy of curriculum. In fact, I was talking about this yesterday with uh, Shana Terrell and folks at the Center for Black Educator Development, my freedom school kids, because we got our Mbangi Monday night before I come into uh, Nubia. You know, they do their monthly and we got our monthly Mbangi starts Monday night. So Monday evening, like seven. So, you know, don't worry, you know, Nubians. We still we're going to have our office hours. But this is what Woodson says. Woodson says that. Um, Negro colleges, he's now in this chapter, he's talking about curriculum. He's focusing particularly on the black colleges. But let's come back and look at this from 2022 eyes in terms of what should be taught. As people keep hocking curriculums as if nobody has been writing curriculums, when in fact people have been writing curriculums, unbroken curriculum well, for over a century. He says, Negro colleges offer courses bearing on the European colonists prior to their coming to America their settlement on these shores, their development here towards independence. Pause. That is a one sentence summary of white curriculum. It's the curriculum all of us learn as children. 
Okay, what do we learn? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, they don't do that rhyme no more. Okay, no problem. Now we're looking for the black. Was there a black person on the boat? Uh, Pedro Alonso Nino was on the boat. Woodson in that Journal Negro History article from 1927 where he's talking about Negro History Week says, y'all keep bringing up Pedro Alonso Nino. No, in 37, the Negro History Bulletin article 10 years later. He says, there ain't no factual evidence, but why y'all keep looking for one black to be in the thing? This is that Me Too history. I'm not talking about Me Too history. I'm not talking about, uh, like Richard Pryor say, you know, why don't they ever include us? We fought the Indians. Shut up, fool. You want them mad at us too? In other words, why y'all keep looking for the mascots? You trying to be footnotes in white history? So he says, um, Negro colleges offering courses bearing on the European colonists prior to their com coming to America. So they where did they start American history? With the English common law with the pilgrims escaping religious persecution, with George Washington them in a fight with the British, no taxation without representation. We don't want a king, we're gonna have a president. But all the points of reference, Magna Carta, all the points of reference, the Greeks and the Romans, all the points of reference, the church and states, all the points of reference come from the mother genealogy. Then you come in, I'm here, okay, in 1619. Negroes born on the water, washed up on the shores. And then we brought our singing and dancing and all that old good stuff. And we fought, we marched, and we cried, and we get in here now. Well, where'd you come from? Uh, I mean, we, we believe in democracy too. Okay, a democracy, demos, we get it. Athenian democracy, that's Athens. What were you doing? Well, uh, and then some of us say, well, what were we doing? We're going to look. And then cats like Andrews is like, oh, that's an odd, that's an odd fixation. Is it? Is it odd? Is it odd? Or are you just talking to your peers and think y'all came up with something? There was a little boy that was misled by another little boy. <laughs> in other words, you know, and then, of course, in the children's story, you know where that ends up. Because if you don't have no memory, you don't have any even something to compare about what it means to have a good society. And so the society you live in and that you think you understand the values of that society become your values. There was a little boy that was misled by another little boy. And this is what he said. Me and you, are we going to make some cash? Robbing old folks and making a dash. In other words, it's all about capitalism. You know, they did the job. Money came with ease. One couldn't stop. It's like he had a disease. <laughs> in other words, you see the hypercapitalism because your values are coming from a society that was born in settler violence. And they start their own story with the violence they were committing in Europe on each other before they came across the ocean and brought you into it. Woodson is saying in the Miseducation of the Negro in that paragraph, he says, now, why? This is the next sentence. He says, why are they not equally generous? Now, you're talking about black people. These are black colleges. Why are they not equally generous? with the Negroes in treating their status. Here we go. He will give you the whole curriculum. He didn't gave you the white curriculum. They start in Europe. They came over here. Then you start celebrating their colonization as if that's manifest destiny. God told us to take it. And their development toward independence. He says, why are they not equally generous with the Negroes in number one, treating their status in Africa prior to enslavement? Oh, where are you starting black history? I'm starting it at the beginning. Woodson says you started the same way they started. Uh, on the Job said this. He said the history of Africa will remain, remain suspended in air until you connect it as far back as you can to the history of Egypt, follow the migrations. You know, why y'all talking about Egypt? We came from West Africa. You've opened your mouth in the words of Catherine Carr. Put your brain on display. Do you understand the M word? What? It is the central theme in human history. What is that? Migrations. How long have we been in West Africa? You can't answer the question because you wouldn't have said what you said if you knew. Woodson says, number one, he doesn't say, let me just read the sentence once because I'm putting the numbers in. He says, why are they not equally generous with the Negroes in treating their status in Africa prior to enslavement, their first transportation to the West Indies, the Latinization of certain Negroes in contradistinction to the development of others under the influence of the Teuton, and the effort of the race towards self-expression. Those four, let's go back through them very quickly. Number one, their status in Africa prior to enslavement. That's why they wrote the African background outline. This is in the 1930s. When we don't study, we don't remember, we keep repeating the, the same mistakes. He says, start with the foundation. 
This is 1933. The Miseducation, Miseducation Negro. Oh, I read that. That's the one where he says, if we don't, you know, if there's not a back door, okay, that's the quote. And that goes on the T-shirt. We need to read the book. Woodson and giving you his philosophy of curriculum in one paragraph in chapter 13, understand the Negro, because he says, what you don't do is understand who we are. And once you don't do that, you become a figment of somebody else's imagination and we're lost. You're now miseducated. So number one, you start with the African background. And then number two, this is where it gets heavy. Their first transportation to the West Indies. So what is he saying there? You did not come to the United States directly from Africa. You went to the to, to Caribbean and then you were put back on boats, taken to New Orleans, taken to Charleston. Taken, this is what happens. Number three, and this is where, it, man, this is 1933. I said it about Sonia Sotomayor. He said, okay, you stretching. Okay, let's go back to Carter Woodson. Woodson's third point is, why don't you study the Latinization of certain Negroes in contradistinction to the development of others under the influence of the Teuton. What does that mean? He says, why don't y'all study where Africans were taken so that you don't narrow your focus to only the Africans who were enslaved by the British? Do you understand that Africans were enslaved by the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Dutch too? Do you understand that most of the Africans that were brought over here, that most of them, there are more of them in Brazil than anywhere else in the hemisphere and anywhere outside of Africa? Do you understand that when you say Haitian and when you say Puerto Rican, when you say Cuban, you are talking about variations and those were Latinized because French is a Latin based language too. But in looking at that, you can use contradistinction to see how your philosophy of race differs from theirs based on who you were colonized by. It, 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 this would be a critique of the 1619 project. So he's writing in in 1933, not 2019 when the magazine came out, not 2021 when the book came out. And from 1933, Woodson is saying, no, wait, no, shit. You, you did not study the effects of Latinization of contradistinction. And then finally, the efforts of the race towards self-expression. What is that? In that little phrase, what is Woodson doing? He is capturing. He is capturing the, the work of self-determination because we never stopped working to self-determine. That's the philosophy of Maroonage. Either escape, or if you can't escape, preserve here what you can. And then coming out of the 19th century, I'll end with this, and tie it to Dr. Williams, who, as I said, had her first ritual in Atlanta, like her husband's a couple of years ago, at Big Bethel AME on Auburn Avenue. That's where Martin Luther King them from. Y'all know Atlanta. When you have the moment to build your institutions, the first book Carter Woodson wrote and published was The Education of the Negro prior to 1861. Civil War started in 1861. Yup. Reverdy Ransom was born in 1861. Yup. Wait, who is Reverdy Cassius Ransom? I encourage you all to get the books that he wrote about himself, but also this book by this sister right here, Annetta Gomez Jefferson, who for many years, he was friends with Jamie McDonald Williams. She was on the faculty at the College of Worcester. This is a book called The Sage of Tawawa, Reverdy Cassius Ransom. Look at the dates, 1861 to 1959. That man lived almost a century. He was born four years before the end of the Civil War. He knew them all. Du Bois said Reverdy, Reverdy Ransom gave a, gave a talk on John Brown, Professor Hunter. Reverdy Ransom gave a speech on John Brown at Harper's Ferry. And it led, because he joined the Niagara Movement with us, it led to the birth of the NAACP. And then he came to the NAACP meeting, the first ones we had, public address in Manhattan, and blew everybody away. Reverend e. Ransom, who knew Booker Washington. Reverend e. Ransom, who knew Fred. How cat who knew Fred? I ain't talking about I was a little boy. He rocked with Frederick Douglass, Henry Neal Turner. Harriet Tubman, come on. And he lived in 1959, and he gave a scholarship to the sister to train me. Please understand, not just train me, Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey has a college degree because of Jamie Williams. Because Jamie mm -hmm. Williams, every time she would see Oprah Winfrey, Daddy Vernon, Vernon in Nashville, he was like, when are you going to get our girl to get out of school? When are you going to get uh, our girl out of school? She had one credit, uh, one senior project to do. She called Oprah and said, look, your daddy going to, and I agree with him, you need to get this degree. So they got it together. And then just before she came for graduation in 1987, which was the year I graduated, she finished her thing, school. She gave an interview where she said she hated college. I'm 22 years old. You talking about Tennessee State? 
I was president of the student body and the president of the Honor Society at Tennessee State, run by her husband, Jamie Coleman Williams' husband, McDonald Williams out of Pennsylvania, my man who made transition to 101 a couple of years ago. This is my honors key. My girl, Deborah Hurd, Professor Deborah Hurd at the University of Nebraska, she uh, she wears hers. I don't even like to wear mine in case I would lose it because I don't trust these Negroes give me a replacement. I don't know if y'all can see that. You can't really yeah. see it. Let me see if I can get it because y'all can't really yeah. see. That is, uh, that's Jehudi. We didn't know who that was. But McDonald Williams knew who it was, designed that. You can't really see it. it says Tennessee State. It's, the cameras not won't let me do it. But Tennessee State University Honors Program. I was the president of Honor Society uh, two terms. When Oprah made that comment, I went off. I was the Tennessean. I miss him. No, you coming here? And you talked about us like a dog? He said, Dr. Williams called me in her office because she was the chair of the Department of Communications. I was a speech and theater major. Her husband was the head of the honors program. That's how I got recruited to Tennessee State because they were at Morris Brown. Remember, she started at Will before. She was there for the split. In fact, she said, <laughs> Charles Wesley was president. I'll tell you how, you got, how they started Central State, which is across the street. Said Charles Wesley took the files of every faculty member, every faculty member at Will before us, but one. Well, what file didn't he take, Dr. Williams? Charles Harris Wesley, Carl G. Woodson's friend, Charles Harris Wesley, the institutional historian of black institutions, wrote the history of the Alphas, the history of the Elks, the history of the Prince Hall Masons, the history of Sigma Pi Phi. I mean, this guy who was a, also ordained minister in the AME church, the president of Wilberforce, almost a bishop in the AME church, lost the vote by a couple of votes. Charles Harris Wesley knew, Dr. Jamie Coleman Williams said, Charles Harris Wesley knew my daddy was an AME minister. My brother's an AME minister. I'm dying in the wool. I'd have died in the wool before us if Mac hadn't got that job at Morris Brown. And when I took, went with him, guess who? Because she said who called me was Bishop Richard Robert Wright Jr. Richard Robert Wright Jr. is the son of Richard Robert Wright Sr., who has a little boy at coming out of Reconstruction, out of Civil War, went to school in a railroad boxcar in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, led by his mother, Harriet. And when the white boys came down there from the Freedmen's Bureau to ask how they were doing, he told the representative of the Freedmen's Bureau as a little boy, tell them we're rising. They called him the black boy of Atlanta. The white boy that asked him that question, his name was Oliver Otis Howard, AS, as in Howard University. His son, Bishop, he was, his son, Bishop uh, Richard Wright, Junior became a bishop of the AME Church. Richard Robert Wright called Jamie Williams at home and said, is it true? What is it true you're leaving Wilberforce? You going to Morris Brown, which is the AME school as well. Uh, when we talk about Dave Chappelle, Allen University, AME school, shorter AME school, African Methodist Episcopal institution building, right? So he, she said, yeah, Mac is going. And he said, I'm going. You can stay. You can leave. I got to go with my husband. Go. They only stayed there in a couple of years. She said, it was great. Then we went to Tennessee State. He was head of the honors program. So I was the president of the honors program when I was an undergrad. And I was senior year president of student body. When I saw what Oprah said, we just we was mad as hell. Dr. Williams called me in her office and said, Greg, if you... And these students protest Oprah. You won't get any letters of recommendation from any of us to go off to school. Hmm. Now, later she would say, there was no way I could enforce that. <laughs> Just like when she took that job at Edward Waters, she said I was about 100 pounds back then and I had these football players in my class. And I told them, if y'all don't stop and quiet down, I will physically remove you from the... She said, I couldn't have moved any of God. But she told me that I love Jamie Williams. I always will. I wouldn't be here without her and her husband because they got their PhDs from Ohio State University. 1959, Dr. Jamie Williams did. She's an English major, English and Wilberforce, English for a master's at Fisk, 1938, then a PhD at, from Ohio State University. The reason I went to Ohio State is because they went to Ohio State and they're friends with Frank Hale up there. In fact, I was reading his, rereading his uh, obituary as I wrote the obituary for my mom. So, you know, this is Frank W. Hale Jr. This mm. is the obituary. I mean, so at any rate, the man, former president of Oakwood College, then vice provost for minority affairs at Ohio State, created Black Visitation Days, meaning what? 
the top five students at all the HBCUs in the country, Ohio State, would pay for them to come to Columbus for a weekend. And they gave all of us the hard sell on why we should come to Ohio State. And then because we'd already been vetted by the universities we came from. And then they would offer us, OK, what schools y'all want to see? And then we would apply and then they look at our stuff. And that's why I have no debt for my law degree. I went to Ohio State because Jamie Coleman Williams and McDonald Williams went to Ohio State. Frank Hale asked me to come as part of them. They had vetted me. I came. They looked. You know, I remember they put the Harvard application in my hand. You should apply to Harvard. I don't go to Harvard. Harvard don't mean nothing to me. Ohio State don't mean nothing to me. Don't mean nothing to me now. I'm going there because they went there. That's how genealogy went. And I went to a black school because I saw what they looked like up close. I'm trained by a different generation. I will tell jokes. We'll have a lot of fun. But in my mind, the way I think about intellectual work is shaped by institution builders, which is where I'm going with this. So Richard Wright called. I'm going to Morris Brown. Okay, no problem. The one file that Charles Wesley, the president of the newly established what became Central State University, left that world before us was the file of the good AME girl who he knew would die before she sold out Wilberforce, <laughs> Jamie Wiggins. So she said, the only file the new president of Wilberforce had coming in was my file. <laughs> because everybody else, he took the files over across the street to Central State. And then, of course, many of the people who were on that faculty of Wilberforce, however, stayed on that faculty of Wilberforce. And, and I went through all that story to, to, to come to this point. Jamie Williams is not an individual only. She represents a mentality. Those black institutions that she was trained in, Dunbar High School segregation, the African Methodist Episcopal Church for which she was loyal to the whole time of her physical life and will now be loyal as an ancestor, the African Methodist Episcopal Church that uh, installed her as the first woman general officer of the AME Church was a shame it took that long, but then I think it was 1988, she became the editor of the AME Church Review, which is the oldest journal published by Black people in this country. Continuous, continuously published journal. I, I, when I wrote my dissertation, I relied on the AME Church Review and the Christian Recorder for the work of Henry Menil Turner, Bishop J.T. Holly, because the AME went to Haiti. Some of them just left the country. Henry Turner and them was like, let's go to South Africa. <laughs> you know, so And it's all in those pages. Uh, Arisha Tuka Faduma, is in there. I mean, uh, I mean, when you see this richness of scholarship, she became the editor of the African Methodist Episcopal Church Review the year after she retired from Tennessee State in 1987, which is why she went Oprah to get out of there. She said, I'm getting ready to retire. While I got the juice to swing this, let's do this. And so, you know, uh, so yeah, I should end that Oprah story by saying that I ain't say nothing until graduation day. If they'd already written my recommendations, I was in, so no problem. <laughs> but I'm saying, she, why are you telling me? I said, you know what, I got home training, Dr. J. You know, damn well, I'm not going to roast her. And then after I finished, because they let the student body president speak if he's a graduating senior or she was a graduating senior. We had women to GGP and them, you know, women and men. You look at HBCUs, it's went a lot of women uh, leadership in student body. Uh, after my remarks, I think they stopped letting student body presidents who were graduating seniors speak. I don't know how many years they stopped <laughs> because I ain't roast her directly. She was sitting there. Look, James Brown said, I'm a man. I'm the son of a man. So in other words, you're not going to talk about, because see, I know you you can, you know, you, nothing personal, because I know you didn't mean it, because I know too many people you went to school with. And she is, and she, and she, once she, and Dr. Williams, you said, once she realized how that, those remarks had been received, she called Dr. Williams apologizing profusely. In fact, one of the professors that she apologized to most was the guy who helped train me as well, William Dury Cox, who was a theater professor. He and H. Devereaux Brady and them cats, you know, she, Mr. Cox, Mr. Cox, Mr. Cox, I'm so sorry. Oh, I shouldn't, I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, okay, 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 okay. In other words, you know you was wrong. And I pretty much said that, that 